I'm in search of conversation guests. If you are interested or know someone that might be interested, please contact me directly. Thank you. So your name is Justin. You work in IT. What do you uh, What do you do in IT? I do a lot of service desk support, help desk. I do a lot of printer stuff, mm -hmm. software support, new hire onboarding, developer support, executive support. Just so many things. I could just detail, and it will take about two minutes to go over everything. <laughs> How long have you been doing it for? Oh, a few years. I was in hardware. I have a job before this. Oh, what were you doing in hardware? Oh, uh, mainly computer hardware support, hard drives, RAM, machines, laptops, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. How long yeah. were you doing that before? About eight years. Yeah. Eight years. Okay. And then, uh, so that you've been in IT per, for a pretty long time then, at least 10 yeah. years. Yeah. Um, yeah. What kind of got you into IT? I just fell into it. It just happened. I was, I felt a little bit lost, you know, right after college. And I think most people yeah. feel that way. Yeah. So I guess if you're a bit lost in life and then an opportunity comes to you and it's not really something you would consider doing, just take it. You never know. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. I took it. Do you remember when you uh, got the hardware job? Was that kind of the, was that your entry into IT at that point? Yes. Yeah. When yeah. you got that job, what, what was the uh, situation like? Did you just get a, you went applied for a bunch of different places and this one just happened to reply? Yep. Yep. That was exactly it. Yeah. Um, what was the requirements when you started there? Was it just uh, that they were going to train you on hardware or you already had a little bit of hardware background or anything? I did. I had a tiny bit of background, but they primarily just trained me. Yeah. Yeah. Back in, uh, overwhelming. what was that? It was a really big company. It was very overwhelming. Mm. Yeah. Back in 2000, no, I, I guess I've been in it my entire career. I, I was, uh, from 1999. No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, 2000 when we graduated. And then 2001, yeah. I went to a computer trade school, a university, and the, uh, well, I call it a trade school, but it was a full university. I have my degree in computer networks. Um, I knew I liked computers then because I was playing with computers back when I was 14 years old. Did you, yeah. were you much of a gamer back, back when you were younger or anything? No, no. I mean, I played Sega and I just stopped. I yeah. was so mad. I was so <laughs> Like, I'm like, I quit. I'm done. That's it. <laughs> well, were you spending like, like a career on Sega games or something? Like 60 hours no, a week? I had the worst luck. Remember, you remember we, you can rent video games and like, Oh yeah. We, I remember like we Friday night, we would go out to dinner and my parents would try to, you know, look for a movie to rent. And I would, I, I had the worst luck with games, renting the crappiest games, like, Probably because they were based off movies, and I, I, I found that the movie, like games based off movies, are really bad. <laughs> that's that's kind of that yeah. uh, seems to be like ninety percent of the time. I think uh, maybe they've gotten a little bit better nowadays, but yeah, mo a lot of video games based on movies are pretty bad. Uh, yeah, it also works the other way around, like movies based on games. Are based on the game. Yeah. Or usually pretty bad movies. Yeah, probably like Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider the movie. Yeah. Um, Mortal Kombat movies in the 90s. Yep, yep. That's funny. Um, so, what what age were you, out of curiosity, what age were you when you just got sick of Sega and you just dropped it completely? Oh, I was probably 14. 14 oh, early. Okay, okay. So, when I, when I knew you in high school, you, you were out of, out of video games entirely. Yeah. I was very much into pulling pranks in high school. <laughs> you, were, uh, you were pretty ruthless sometimes. 
<laughs> what were some of, what were some of the best pranks that you could remember? <laughs> oh, s s someone someone took off a uh, the tip of a squirt gun and they screwed it onto the water fountain. So whenever someone would bend over to get a drink of water, it would just shoot them straight up in the face. And that was that was hilarious. I didn't do that, but I noticed it and someone did in our you know, our little group of pranksters probably. Yeah. That's yeah. funny. Um did you guys ever well back then uh, recording I was gonna say did you ever record on video? I'm guessing back then we didn't really have that technology back in what 1994 1996 probably 1996 yeah uh we didn't have a camcord or what do you call it uh one of those big video recorders <laughs> the vhs yeah. tapes i remember that. it would show like the year like in the right hand corner <laughs> year. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's funny um okay so about eight years ago, you get into hardware, and now you're into um, all types of support um, yeah. for for a company. What do you What do you like about doing the support, and what do you dislike about doing uh, desktop support? Well, I like the challenge. Um, it's never boring, never dull. I've noticed that IT is very much unlike any other job or most jobs. Like for instance, if you're a plumber or if you're a roofer and you decide to take a year off, like a sabbatical or something, when you come back a year later, everything is probably the same. Same problem, same situation, same tools. In IT, you come back a year later, you're rusty, there's things, new problems you haven't dealt with. You gotta, I mean, you're, you've been out of the game. It's like, um, Almost like being an athlete, you have to really keep in shape. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I, li I like that. I like the dynamic, the fast pace and stuff. That... It almost seems like it's moving almost too quick at times. Maybe yes, is, yeah. is that me getting old? I'm not sure, but it is. It is so rapid, like from programming languages to, um, I mean, even the software afterwards, if you're using like data analytic tools like Tableau, um, Oracle, all these different big data things, uh, reports, and that's just on the data side. Then you got the network layer, you got printers. I mean, I'll, there's a few qu funny questions about printers later. I'll get to, I, I was cracking up at some of the, oh, okay. the hate towards printers, <laughs> some yeah. of the questions, but, um, I, I don't know what to think about. It almost feels like it's getting more complicated than we humans can grasp at times. But Definitely. some of us are able to deal with it, but it just seems like there's so much. I don't know. It's crazy. Uh, that's why I, com I guess that's why when you say that it's unlike any other field, because like you're saying, I guess with the plumber or or a, um, any 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 person, I don't know. Yeah, a plumber. Say a plumber. If you walk away for a year and you come back, like the piping is probably the same. The the terminologies there's not new software yeah. new new hardware new protocols um what uh so you that's the aspect that you do like what aspect do you dislike about uh being in uh, desktop support what do i dislike um there is a lot of redundancies and duplicity in the sense that one person is having a significant issue like they can't connect to the vpn or they can't connect and they've called they left multiple voicemails and then the supervisor calls and someone else calls so there's always like tickets and extra layers of basically the same thing so there's a lot of duplicity and i think that has to do with just lack of communication which is very common in within it but also within like the group's it supports a lack of communication is like detrimental in my experience when there's so many like uh i guess being in the it world i i'm i see all the memes online when like uh support um memes when you when a it user um tries to plug a v their vga cable into their uh to their network card and they say it doesn't work like they yeah. uh, i see all these memes what's your your feeling of supporting end users and then 
And then on the flip side, if end users get upset with uh, support, well, I don't know, what's, what's your thoughts on all that? I So basically, it's very easy to fall into the situation where it's it becomes you versus the user versus the problem. So it, it's imperative that you ally yourself with the user so it becomes you and the user versus the problem. So I've, I've learned to become really good at that. And I need to be very patient, be very nice and understanding. Uh, and and just, just understand, like not everyone knows a lot about this stuff. Maybe their their kids set their computer up for them or their significant other did all that for them. Or before COVID, when the company was on site, we did all that. and. So what happens is I found myself becoming so pressed for time, I would just do it for people just because I'm like so pressed for time, just get it out of the way. But maybe perhaps in the long run, that's a disservice to the individual because they haven't learned to properly plug in a display port cable or VGA or DVI or whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, so uh, I actually broke a rule don't give users your cell phone number. Oh, shit. <laughs> because when COVID hit, oh. 95, we had to move from, we went from 5% of the company's remote to about 96% of the company is now working from home. And lots of users, as just as you described, and they will, we would get like 100 voicemails a day. Wow. And so I'm trying to like work with the person and they're trying to describe the color and the pins and they don't really know how to characterize it. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what? Here's my cell phone number. Go ahead and text me pictures or FaceTime me, whatever you, what, I mean, just whatever it takes mm -hmm. to get this person set up because they may actually be bad at IT, but they're actually phenomenal at what they do in this, some, it, it, whatever that department is. Mm -hmm. It's just that the IT thing is not their thing. That's my thing. Yeah. So I took that rule of don't give users your cell phone number. <laughs> I the window. Can I have your cell phone number in case I have any issues? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, that, that's a fantastic thing that you said earlier, actually. I think that's probably, um, I, I, I don't think I could put in better words where you said, um, you have the problem be the common enemy between you and the end user. I think something that I did because um, when I got started in programming, I was before that company let me do production code changes on my own. Uh, they would let me do production code changes, but I was I was still like level two support, level one support for a while, yeah. and I made sure to explain the pro the way I turned it is made sure that they understand the problem and clearly define. Okay, this is what we're gonna do. This is what we're gonna look at this is what we think the problem is we don't know and then that's i, I feel like that's what i had a a good mo most of the time there was a good outcome dealing with the end user because they they felt like they understood what we're doing and they they would also understand if the problem took three hours five hours they would know that we're waiting for something that's not in our control yeah yeah <clears throat> um what are some of the toughest challenges that you kind of remember dealing with a uh, desktop support? Oh, there was one. I, I was still a temp at the time and I was given a simple assignment, removing this guy from one office to another office. Okay. That's pretty easy. And he was moving into a much bigger office with a really huge desk and he was very adamant about the, cables being a certain way and he had a lot of stuff and his computer was kind of an older machine and this guy is pretty high up there. He is brilliant in terms of handling metadata, which is data about the data. And I just didn't know. And so I move all his equipment to his new office and I'm still a temp. And when you're a temp, you don't really want to rock the boat. You don't want to be on the spotlight a lot. So he's upset because his computer keeps rebooting. And I'm like, okay, 
well, when I take a look and I took it, I took it apart and there's like dust and blew it out, replaced the RAM, put it back. And then the next day he goes, yeah, the computer keeps rebooting on its own over and over again. We eventually re replaced the whole thing. This, this went on for over a few days. Every time he walks out, the computer is rebooted. He thought it was like mocking him or something like that. He thought it was some weird entity had taken over this office. Some invisible force was rebooting the computer. We ended up replacing the whole thing. Brand new computer. And guess what? Every time you walk out, it's still rebooting. Oh, and geez. so no one can, no so I'm a temp. No one can figure this out. I'm on the spot. I'm on stage. My coworker looked at me straight in the eye and says, Do not screw this up. Don't screw this up. This guy's really high up. This thing is going way up there. And all my superiors, it's been escalated. No one can figure this out. And then one day he's like pounding on our door, like boom, 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 boom. And he's really upset. And everyone's like looking at me. And I remember like staring up at the ceiling light, just spacing out and looking at the light. And I realized every time I walk into his office, the lights automatically turn on. <laughs> and that, that's when I realized what if what if his computer is plugged into a power strip and that power strip is plugged into the outlet for the light <laughs> and that's exactly what it was. <laughs> it, it was it was crazy. It was, it was just absolutely crazy and the guy came over and thanked me personally, he patted me on the back and he said, Great job. Well done. <laughs> Brilliant. Well done. Huh. It's it's unfortunate that the in it's unfortunate that I guess companies or the way that we are as humans we work in that sense. I guess I'll I'll try to explain it. Like so, he has a job to do. You have a job to do. It's not like you're out to try to vindictively screw him yeah. over. And I wish right. I wish that people would see that with uh, IT support so often. Um, I mean, even when I, when I got a senior in programming, I would get certain support calls where it would go through a couple levels before it got to me. And I'm in the weeds looking at the code, trying to help these people out. I'm, I'm doing like, sometimes as you're not in a big company, you shouldn't, but at that small company, I had access to the production database. So I could do live edits to fix this person's data, but they were so furious at me. I'm trying to actually don't, I don't even remember what, what was the case. She was trying to buy a product. Um, I actually don't even rem remember. She was just so hot that I said, okay, ma'am, just give me a second. Let me try to look at your order and see what's going on with this. And I got to get pretty deep into the database to try to figure out where the, where the, there's so many layers, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like one table of data connects to another table of data and I got to trace all that and it's just massive. So I tell her, just give me a moment. And with like, within like three seconds, she's all, what are you doing? How long are you taking? Why are you taking so long? I'm like, whoa, wow. chill out. I didn't, I actually didn't even say chill out. I said, uh, ma'am, I'm just looking at the database. It takes a lot, a, a really long time for me to try to figure out all this data. And, um, it's just crazy that she doesn't recognize that I really was trying, I'm not trying to screw her over at all. I was trying to help yeah. her out. I was trying the best I could. Um, in that case, I, it was pretty funny because uh, I won't say the person name, my, that person's name, but my coworker, he got, he was doing, uh, he was doing level, level two support and that yeah. he got furious at a person earlier that day and he actually mm -hmm. yelled at a customer and usually you don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so when he heard me on the phone with this lady, he could tell that she could, he could tell that she was yelling. He, he didn't even have to hear her voice. He could hear my voice. And then um, he could just hear the stuff that I'm saying. Like, oh ma'am, it's just taking a minute. Please give me some time. Uh, please, uh, I'm, I'm trying to work with you. I'm trying to explain you to the problem. And then right. he, he eventually said to me, you know what? Karma's a bitch. Go ahead, uh, get, hand, hand over that lady. Let me take care of her. I yelled at somebody earlier today. I need to be nice to somebody, even though how, how mean they are. Um, it was kind of funny. That was a funny one. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish, I, I don't know what, I don't know why our society is kind of set up 
where people get angry at us. It, it could be any field, really, but I, it feels like IT is especially worse, I, I feel like. It like depends if you, on the company, really. What was that? It depends on the company. Yeah. I wanted to connect it to, like, say, Starbucks. Like, if you go to Starbucks, you see they have a bunch of orders, probably. Uh, you, may, you may or may not see it, but you could see a bunch of people lining up, waiting in the queue, and in the, they've already paid for their drinks. So you could, you could kind of yeah. visibly tell what's going on. You could see it's oh, yeah. understaffed, um, and yeah. it's sort of no point to be upset at that person. Um, but I guess with IT, it's different because people don't understand it. People think IT is just easy. Um, that kind of goes probably good with a question that Mark asked, Mark asked online. He said, um, when people find out that you know IT stuff, do they think that they could get free advice? How do you, how do you, how do you walk through that landmine of uh, helping someone and not helping someone? Yeah, so that, that comes with the territory. They get asked a lot, I need to buy a laptop. Which one should I get? And I, I sort of equate it with the same question, like, I need to buy a car. What should I get? So I asked them, what are you going to use it for? What kind of programs? Do you, is it something advanced, something base, basic? I mean, you, you don't want to spend 3000 bucks for basically a Facebook machine. Um, but if you want to do some video intensive work, you don't want to have an underperforming machine either. So I usually ask them like a lot of questions and then I make recommendations. It always comes down to try before you buy, get your hands on it, try it out. I know with COVID and going to Best Buy and trying it out in person is a little tricky, but just, that's what I would just tell people, try before you buy. Yeah. Um, but are there people that try to get you for free advice and it's just too much? Does that happen to you? Yeah. Uh, for instance, this happened the other day where I was helping the doctor with a display issue and then she has her iPhone 6, which apparently Apple has no longer supporting. And but she also has an iPhone 7 and she's asking me questions about iCloud and stuff and I gave her some recommendations and everything like that. It's not too common for me. It happens, but it's not like an everyday thing. Hmm. Uh, do you, is your circle of friends mainly all IT related people or, or, or how does that work out? Oh, no, I'm friends with all sorts of, all, all sorts of people. So then yeah. the other people that know that, that work in other professions, do they hit you up with uh, IT questions often? Mm, not, not really. I think, I, I know some people are bothered that they're asking for help. Yeah, okay. I and can see that. I guess they don't want to show a vulnerability, so maybe they, they try to look it up themselves, Google, stuff like that. Do you, for me, it doesn't, it's not too common yeah. in that personal area. Yeah. Is there any uh, TV shows that you watch that are somewhat IT related? Uh, like even, um, what's that one in the IT crowd? I think the, the British comedy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Classic, yeah. yeah. Is there any other shows like that, that, uh, that you watch? And do you think that they portray IT? Actually, maybe the question would be, do you think movies portray IT very well? Movies? No, because <laughs> there's always some like scene in a movie. There's some, hacker it's like a there's like a you know this, this it's like a stereotypical screen with like the green numbers and like <laughs> the matrix typing for like 20 seconds and they go okay i'm in whatever whatever it is so yeah movie, no that's totally wrong that's, yeah that's so wrong but the it crowd like show they're, they're in the basement like where where i was at technically the first floor, but the lobby is a second floor. So we were technically the basement and now my job before this one, we were definitely in the basement. I mean, there was no windows, <laughs> nothing. Oh, geez. The ceiling was really low and it was so much artificial lighting. Like you, you get a headache and you walk outside and as soon as the sunlight hits your forehead, boom, your headache has <laughs> disappeared. So yeah. Oh man. When it, when it depra 
portrays them in the basement. Yeah, they they nailed that part. And all the upper floors are like the different departments. And, yeah. Yeah. What uh what IT tips would you have for common people? Like for me, one thing that I've been using a whole lot for the last few years that I suggest everyone do is uh, get a password manager. Those yeah. are so helpful. I I, I can't describe I, I don't know how to describe how many I feel like how many minutes I save each time I would have to do a password uh, a password change but also like a complex password and it, it, it's able to keep a complex password for you and then if you get one password hacked if I mean in if you have one password and you use that for all the sites at least this password manager you got one password so if, just make your one password super long like 20 30 characters and hopefully that's pretty damn secure. And then, and then uh, the password manager will have unique passwords for all, all your sites. But what would you, kind of like that, what would you have as a suggestion for most people? Use a different password for every single account. I, I had a friend who like used his name, and his, his name was real short, and one, two, three or something, and use it for every single account and he got hacked i think nothing major i think it was his apple account and there was some changes to itunes some purchases and that was it but he ended up using the same password for multiple accounts which was his name and then like one two three which is horrible password yeah oh yeah have a have a, have a password manager make one for you yeah any uh, any things you use on the job daily? Those um, tricks or tips for from an for IT people if they're listening, like that they could uh, follow or do that you find that helps your daily job. Yeah, I found that the most when troubleshooting, the most important thing is problem definition because what happens is like someone says here's the problem here's the issue and then you find that later on that was just a symptom of a much greater thing so and, and users they're not the best at communicating problems so just really ask them what's happening what is it what does it look like where is it what are you experiencing and if you remote into the computer use the use the snipping tool in windows or something to take a snapshot of what they're experiencing definitely another thing is is tinkering is extremely important because i always found myself in situations where there was a problem and it, and it would happen quite a bit and the knowledge document whatever would say you have to do a and then b and then c except in my instance that doesn't work anymore something happened so i would ask some superiors and they will go well i don't know what to tell you it's, it's supposed to be a and b and c so at that point i would have to experiment and tinker and then try to fix it on my own machine and whatever fix i came up with i would do it on the uh, user's machine so yeah that's that's a good piece of advice yeah i totally wholeheartedly agree with that yeah. when i was uh i guess this story doesn't really help that much but the, the i think it's the uh what how i would define tinkering so when i was going to college they were teaching NT, uh, windows nt networking how to set up a domain controller add clients and whatnot um yeah so i i stood up like five computers in my room i was working at a i was working at a computer refurbish refurbishing place where um any really they were super old computers so i took these really old computers that are able just to run windows nt so I set up five crappy computers and I set up a domain controller and added computers on in and out. What that did do, even though I ended up never, I think I never ended up using that Windows NT experience from home, but I felt super confident when I went to any job interview and they said, oh, have you dealt with Windows NT? I would say, yes. Yeah, I've, I've done domain controllers and clients and uh, groups and whatnot. Um, whether how much, how thorough I was with knowing that, but at least I... I would feel confident enough to just say that I do have experience. Um, what was the other one? Oh, in 2002, I was learning programming 
at the job, I was a junior programmer where they're actually ch training me on the job, which is really nice. So then I, I was really super nerdy and I loved it. I loved learning programming. So I went, I would program at work. I would come home and then continue reading the book that they gave me and I would continue to learn to program. And actually in 2002, I was trying to program what is, I was programming a thing I called suggestionfinder.com. It was a site where you could search restaurants and review restaurants and uh, what ended up being in 2004, Yelp came out. In 2002, I was already, I actually had this pretty cool like coupon system that I thought was really in, innovative back then. Back then, yeah. Yeah. you could have a, if the company went in and claimed their business, they could, uh, create unique coupons and these coupons had a 30 uh i'm not sure if, if you know goods within windows and or databases goods so you get a unique 32 character id and i would print that on the coupon and then i would um have it in the system where that if the if the customer came in and redeemed that coupon they could only redeem it once they can't give it to their friends and use it multiple yeah. times so back in 2002 i was doing that so later on as i went through at work uh, like six months later, my manager was like, man, you're picking up coding really quick. How, like you're learning really quick what's going on. And I said, well, I've been doing this at home too. And so eventually he was able to give me, uh, raises and stuff. So tinkering mm -hmm. around, I think it's oh, huge. Yeah. I think it's massive. I think mo I think a lot Absolutely. of people should do it all. I mean, not just it, I think that's everything. I think tinkering is everything. Um, whether, I mean, even if you're a bakery, seriously, if you're in a bakery and you like baking, uh, baking things actually for, uh, when I was a pizza person, when I, I worked in a pizza shop when I was four, 14, 16 years old. And, uh, I don't know if you remember giant pizza King near uh, West Hills. Yeah. So, uh, I used to work there for a couple of years and I would uh, take the dough and try to make pet pretzels for fun. Um, mm -hmm. so it's just like tinkering like that. Like the, the boss would see me like, Oh, you, you could do this. Like maybe we could put that on the menu sometime. So yeah, tinkering is, is massive. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Is there any, uh, any regrets you have in your life on not getting either getting involved in it for too long or not quick enough or personalities? Like is your personality fit for it? Uh, regrets. I kind of regret my major in college. Yeah, what's um, what's your major? It was public relations. I just I was I was really good at writing at the time. Mm -hmm. And but I didn't, I wasn't really into the classes. I just but it was, by that point it was too late. I kind of regret that. Yeah, yeah I kind of regret not getting an IT sooner. Hmm. But it's so fast paced. I guess it's it's irrelevant. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. The it's one. It's like. Oh, uh, go ahead. It's, it's like a, like a craft. You can really learn a lot just on your own. Mm -hmm. There's no gatekeeper that keeps the knowledge tucked away, hidden in some vault or library that only the selected few have access. No, there's just, it's everywhere. What? Yeah. What? One thing that I found. Uh, um. I want to uncommon, not uncommon. Something I didn't expect in IT was later on when I worked at a bigger company that had like 5,000 employees and I was working on their IT systems, I noticed that emailing became a bit of a, I want to say art or a political play on your position. Like if you knew how to email things and get the message out to higher ups. Yeah. If you knew how to get your message within one sentence or two sentences at the top and make sure you might even want to embellish the issue, depending on who you're emailing to, that became an interesting dynamic in IT, which I didn't expect that in IT. Yeah, the subtle communication nuances, mm -hmm. it was like a message within the message, something's not being said, but it is being said in that email. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly yeah. Yeah. It, it, to some extent, some of the emails I saw other it people would send lengthy emails that would tell all the technical things. And I'd have to, I would tell them, well, this is going to a VP or a, di a di um, director. They don't really have a whole bunch of time or they don't, or they don't think your message is that important. So you need to kind of figure out 
how do I play this this game, this gamify gamify it and figure out how do I get the best results for me? And for me, yeah. I want I want a promotion or a raise. <laughs> That's kind of all I want. Or to get the job done. <laughs> get the job done. That's right. Yeah. Um, Quan asks, what's the most ridic ridiculous question you've been asked? So this, our company had, before COVID, another office in El Cajon. And it was a much, much more laid back atmosphere. And I noticed some of the users were much less tech savvy. And there was a user who was like, my computer won't turn on. So she, she walked me over to her like cubicle and she points to the monitors, which are off. But there was no computer at the desk. There was nothing. She's like, my computer doesn't turn on because there's no, I'm thinking there's no computer there. So she's technically right. But that was, and I didn't want to make her feel bad. I'm like, okay, all right, okay. So just, let me take, let me take care of this. And what's worse is that there were like, there was like a power cable and a bunch of cables where there should be a computer, like right there. Clearly there's no computer. No, that has to be the worst question. <laughs> I, I just had poker face. I was in work mode. I didn't want to make it feel bad. So I'm like, okay, well, let me, uh, let me take a look. I'll get, I'll get to this. That's funny. I don't think I've had, uh, I don't yeah. think I've had something that bad. And Emmett asks, why do computers often get confused talking to printers? Probably because nowadays printers actually are computers like the big big jumbo multi-function printers that you see in offices actually have hard drives and ram in them and so there's like protocols and maybe some security if they're on some kind of network i always found if you're at home the quickest way is just a straight up usb cable from your computer to the printer and that's the, that's the fastest easiest way for Emmett. Uh, that's actually really funny with Emmett. Um, I was I actually helped him with his printer thing. For whatever stupid reason, I think the USB uh, the connector or the USB uh, what do you call it? Just the connector and the that that module on the printer actually I think is bad uh, or faulty. So mm -hmm. luckily on the printer, there's there yeah yeah it happens yeah. There's two other ways to print. Uh, um, Wi-Fi network and or um, the I think NF, NFC printing from your like your phone. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we so I helped him hook the the printer to the network and then he was able to print. So it was when the USB cable was plugged in, it it kept on connecting to the computer and then disconnecting by itself. So we didn't we didn't know why. So then I just decided to try the network thing and the network thing worked out. Hmm. Um, but I, I think, like you said, there's there's probably too many pieces in all printers, whether it's uh, home printers or big office printers. There's just so many moving pieces. Huh? That's kind of funky. I wonder why printers are more more faulty than routers. I I, I guess printers have so much moving parts and yeah, it's it's not just a printer. It's a printer. It's a scanner. It's some there might be like a stapling mechanism in there as well. There's like document feeders and stuff, and yeah. Because huh. actually, uh, on on the Facebook post, then another friend underneath that posted. Her name is Two. She also said, "Yeah, what the fuck's up with printers?" So both of them <laughs> are having printer issues. I deal with them. I deal with them a lot. In fact, I had this huge issue. There's, I mean, ninety six percent of the company I work for is remote. There's still a few people on site for whatever reason and one is like this uh, doctor this printer just went connected to the network and every single time i ran into this i would re reboot the whole printer and it would reconnect well it wasn't doing it this time and it, it kind of blew up and she was frustrated the situation blew up not the printer but she was frustrated and i kept 
I kept bringing this issue up, and they're like, check with the networking team. Check, check the network clauses. Everything looked good. I kept, I checked with the networking team twice. Everything looks good. And everyone, see, sometimes I don't listen very well, but it pays off in my job because everyone kept telling me one thing, but my intuition is like <laughs> something in the printer. So they had three technicians from the printer company because sometimes they come in and he, he, three technicians have never seen anything like this. And, and I'm like, yeah, this, this is pretty weird. And then he showed me a, some photos on his phone where from another company, people were keeping liquor bottles and stuff and Tabasco bottles inside the printer in the drawers, like hiding them and margarita mix. So he, he thinks, at the, not my company, but the, this other one, he thinks someone is like an alcoholic and they kind of like keep the margarita mix and margarita, all the alcohol inside the printer drawers so they mix it when no one's looking. And <laughs> Anyway, so he can figure it out. And, but there's so many parts to it. I mean, I, I even look for mice. Like I was opening the drawers looking for mice because this happened in my last job where the mice had gotten into the printer and they had gnawed on the wires and when it connected to the network. So I'm like looking around for mice, everything. But there's so many moving parts to it, but it turns out you had to replace the motherboard, the hard drive, everything. But I was being told it's, it's a networking problem, but my intuition was saying, no, it's this machine. It, it comes down to this device. There's something wrong, this massive device that probably weighs close to a ton, maybe as much as a car, I don't know. Hmm. But it's just so many moving parts and components and th things that go wrong. Yeah, absolutely. By any Printers are, um, it's either really easy to figure out or it's something really intense. Hmm. That's my experience. By any chance from your, your time working with printers, do you happen to have a preference on a brand of uh, printers or anything a home, for home printers? I know Brother, they do really good printers. Um, HP, well, they, HP makes so many different kinds of printers, so I guess it depends. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some are better than the other ones. Sharp are really good, so yeah. I don't think printing isn't really necessary anymore. I don't have a printer. I, I never print. I just do PDFs now. Yeah. Yeah. For, you, you, you uh, I print maybe once or twice a year. Uh, it's usually like government related paperwork. Uh, either yeah. so something strange with taxes or or what's the recent uh, I did uh, my green card paperwork for my wife. So we mm -hmm. had to print it print stuff out yeah. um yeah like once or twice a year it seems like and then that's the once or twice a year i got to mail something in too so then i got to go buy a stamp i don't buy <laughs> i don't buy yeah. stamps normally um so i got to buy an envelope buy a stamp actually now i just since it's only once or twice a year i just actually just go to like um the ups store and then just have my if i have my stack of three papers and i just say hey can you mail this out for me or i actually go there uh where I've mailed the PDF to their email address. And then I just mm -hmm. ask them, print it out. And can you mail it too? And I pay for all of it, which kind of sucks. Cause it's like, after everything's said and done, I think it's near like almost $5, uh, maybe yeah. like $4 to ship, to send out three, four or five pieces of paper. But I mean, once or twice a year, eh, that's all right. Hmm. Um, I used to, a, a long time ago when I worked at IBM, doing a uh, desktop support, uh, application desktop support. Um, I used to suggest Dell for people. This was back in 2000, 2003. Um, oh yeah. Back then Dell computers seemed to be pretty solid. I mean, not, they weren't, if, if it's just, if someone said, Hey, I want a workstation at home. And then I, I'd say, are you going to do any gaming? And if they said yes, then I'd like, eh, probably not Dell. If they're, if they're doing just email and Excel, then I would say, you know, Dell is a pretty solid uh, PC to buy. Nowadays, I don't, I actually don't know what, what would you, if someone came to you and said, hey, I'm just looking for a workstation to Excel and email, what would you suggest? I know Lenovo are pretty solid. Yeah. The, they're pretty good for about three years. The battery will tend to wear out about two and a half years in and the trackpad. A lot of people use a dual trackpad on the Lenovo's. Tend to wear out. Yeah. 
and but they're pretty solid. They're nice. They're built for durability and travel. Because some laptops don't travel well. You just carry them around and yeah, all sorts of problems. If if mobility is important, yes, a laptop. But I, I I've seen people who get a laptop and they just keep it at their their desk at home mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they probably be better off with a desktop. Yeah, which probably, from my observations, lasts way longer than the laptops because all the electrical components are all more compacted in a laptop. There's less space for the heat and air to flow, and therefore it wears out faster. Yeah. If you're buying hardware nowadays, where where do you buy from? I'm usually buying from Newegg.com or or Amazon. Yeah, the same. Newegg, Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like Best Buy has kind of never been on my list. Um, for a while, I think they still have it. They'll price match with Amazon. So that's a, is it Best Buy? I think it was Best Buy. Mm -hmm. Or am I missing yeah. it up with Fry's? Because Fry's will also price match with Amazon. I heard Fry's was very inconsistent with that. I heard uh, stories of people just going to Fry's. Here we go, price match. And they're like, sorry, we can't do it for some, yeah. some reason. Yeah, I had a uh, oh, randomly thinking about the question earlier where people ask you for help for IT help. I, I had I feel like I get, got that a lot. And yeah. the I think the problem is they think it's so easy for you to do it. And I think it's unfair for them. It's like I don't if they happen to do if their job is, I don't know, baking. I don't come to them and ask them, hey, can you bake me something for the next eight hours? Or can you show me how to bake that for the next yeah. eight hours? I think that's unfair if they say, oh, hey, I need this help with this uh, Excel document. I need to do this or that, or I need help with a printer. Um, I've had plenty of friends that, or people that I know, that try to pull the friend card and want you to help them out intensively for a big project. And it, it it's unfortunate that they they somehow think it's so easy for us. I, I don't know where that, why is that different than other professions like baking? We never think about going to a baker and say, hey, bake, can you, hey, this is so easy for you for eight hours or four hours, you bake this for me. But yeah. in IT, they'll think about that and they'll say, hey, I need, I need your help on this IT problem. It's, I don't know why that's different. That I is, try to be cognizant of maybe they're so busy at work they don't want to do that when they get home. Mm -hmm. I read about people who quit their job so they could sell stuff on Etsy.com. Remember Etsy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And which they really enjoyed, but when they found themselves relying on Etsy to do to make a living, they found they didn't really enjoy it anymore. So. Yeah, it's tricky territory. Like, do you have relatives that hit you up for random questions or something? something um, like not lately. Not yeah, not lately. Family. Um, yeah, I would say for a couple years now, the IT requests have been lower. Um, yeah. 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 I don't know. Yeah, me too. Me as well. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay, so this, I think this is an interesting question. Quan asks, is the average person really challenged with understanding IT or the hardware they are, or the ar hardware they are using? Um, so I think his question comes from, is IT that hard or are people just not wanting to learn or people just stupid, too stupid to learn? I, th I think it's more not wanting to learn. Maybe it's... Um lack of time they have families and stuff so uh there was one user at my work she was explaining to me how her her ex-husband did everything for her set up the stereo hooked up the tv the computer and everything and then then her kids helped her out and everything but she never learned to do that on her own in the instance of, of divorce 
which happened where she's on her own and she has to do this stuff on her own and it kind of bothered her. So run, I run into that quite, a, it's quite a bit. It's very common that the average person has trouble with IT stuff. Like there were before COVID, there were people in my work who did had, who had no internet at all. They had nothing. And in the process of moving them to work remotely from home, it became apparent to me that yes, there are people who have no internet at all and they had to get internet in order to work from home. In fact, someone asked me, do I need the internet work to work from home? And I go, yeah. <laughs> you know, nicely, of course, but I'm like, yeah. And I thought, well, I wonder how, how do they pay bills and all that? I guess they could still put their rent money in an envelope and utilities might be included in that. Maybe the car is paid off. I I never ask those questions because it's it's too personal. Yeah, that's yeah, totally. Like, yeah, that's personal. I don't want to go there. But yeah, a lot of people still struggle with basic IT stuff. I found that's crazy. That th oh, go ahead. That became really apparent. That's crazy to think that somebody would not have internet at their home nowadays. To some degree, did they have smartphones? Do you remember? Some of them did. So hopefully, they're at least just doing stuff through their phone. Hopefully. Yeah, so but a few of them had no smartphone, no home computer, no internet. And so we use an RSA app on the phone to authenticate. But in order to set that up, you have to use a computer because they can't the computer's not gonna work. A lot of them a lot of them have thin clients, so they can't go to a website, you know what I mean? Sort of like a circle of failure, but yeah, so they have to go back to the office and use that. But there were also people who were stuck because like their their roommate would also be the landlord. And the router or the internet was so slow, but that their landlord would, would never upgrade it. So that person's kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. So like, well, I can't upgrade it. It's only like 20 megabits per second or something like that, which is woefully insufficient it has to be at least like 35 40 for our for our work so they're kind of stuck like i i can't tell people well have you tried moving like i, don't know. <laughs> like, I can't say that but it, it might be a solution tell them to get out of the stone age of shit <laughs> yeah like their 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 landlord just comes home and just watches reruns of golden girls and just knits there's no internet Basically, the internet would be part of a package, and for, for the TV. So they would just watch, you know, reruns of Gilmore Girls and Golden Girls or whatever, Friends, whatever. And the internet package would be the internet would be so slow that the user, who would be the roommate, was out of luck in that case. That's crazy. Slow internet. I can't imagine living with uh, slow internet. I, maybe that's a uh first world problem that I don't want to have. Um, yeah. There's so many things that we, do, uh, that we do on the internet. Um, but I guess I can understand, say someone, their job is something that's not anything related to computers. I could see them not needing computers at home to some degree, but that's got to really impact the idea of tinkering on anything else in life because so much is on the internet. You could learn, more about baking on YouTube. You could learn more about fixing printers on YouTube. You could learn, I mean, that really hampers your, your, your future almost in, in today's world. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've explained to people like the way technology works is that there's some new thing that comes up like the telephone, the telephone at one point was some radical new technology and a few years go by a few people have one then only the rich people can have one and then more and more produced and then people get telephones and they kind of find a use for them over time there comes a point where you have to have a telephone every house needs a telephone yeah you can't function without a telephone so eventually we're probably at that point now we're pretty close to it where 
you have to have some kind of internet connection. And then almost high speed internet to some extent, because if you're still taking um, <clears throat> two hours to download one MP3, a four ma uh, MP3 file, a song that's four megs, that's pretty slow internet. Um, oh yeah, wow. Because if like, <laughs> I'm just I'm just throwing up some random dial numbers. Up days, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that, that that's actually <laughs> I was uh, reminiscing about my dial-up days with uh, with Napster back in <laughs> dial-up <laughs> days. Um, oh yeah, I remember those days very well. Very well. I remember going in chat rooms and like talking to girls and they would ask for your like age asl backslash height backslash weight oh I, it was uh, a, a asl for what i remember um age yeah. sex location yes that was it yeah <laughs> yeah those are some uh some good old days if she was in different zip code, that might as well have been like a different country. There's just no way. That yeah. Because <laughs> back then you didn't have a car to get around. Yeah. Have a bicycle if you're lucky. <laughs> I remember talking to these girls. My, my friend was over at my house and they wanted to meet up at the mall. And in front of like the Hello Kitty store or something, I don't remember. Maybe it was like Suncoast Video. It was like a bench in like Parkway Plaza. Was yeah. Those benches. Yeah. And we show up and wait in there. And I saw some girls sitting on the benches, kind of looking at us kind of wearily. I mean, my friend was like, where are they? Where are they? And I saw them kind of like look at us and kind of whisper in their ears. And they kind of like nodded their heads. <laughs> and they got me glad. <laughs> I told my friend... I don't think I'm gonna show up, dude. Like, <laughs> that was That's awesome. The '90s I didn't Tinder. Like, yeah, I, did, I didn't want to break the news. I'm just like, they're not coming, dude. Just trust me. That's awesome. Back then, I don't. Yeah, I never ever. I don't think I ever met anyone online until I was about nine, nineteen or twenty, somewhere around there. Twenty, twenty-one years old was the first time I met someone online. And uh, I'm still in touch with that person now. Um, but I remember, it was, I mean, just that's just the way the internet is and how things are evolving. I remember thinking, I was telling my cousins like, hey, I invited that one guy that we played Counter-Strike with. We've been playing with him for like months online and he seems cool. He says he, he could drive down and meet us. Uh, so yeah. I figure we have a party gathering tonight and if he shows up, great. If not, then, uh, then we'll, and he doesn't show up, but if he shows up with a knife and a gun, then we, uh, at least there's power in numbers with us. And uh, things turned out well. He was a great friend. I went to his wedding. Uh, we still keep in touch now. Visited him in Hawaii later on once he moved there. Um, yeah, the internet, it's a big, scary, awesome place. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's, it has its own vernacular and lingo. And like, there's only things that exist on the internet but not real life but they, they by the same token they still exist yeah what do you think about the uh the wall street bets thing with reddit and uh, gamestop right now uh i haven't been following the news last week but okay. i heard something about this and it it might it might be one of those things where the people who were behind it didn't realize the impact it would have i guess Hmm. Like I thought they would have some impact. Like I remember reading about the, the the physicists who developed the atom bomb for the Manhattan Project, and when it, when it actually when it went off, it was like two hundred more times powerful than they could have ever imagined, even yeah. beyond their predictions, calculations. So, you no, know, maybe it was something like that. Yeah, the I. I've looked into it a bit. This is what I understand. Uh, so it's the hedge fund managers who were putting shorts to, uh, to GameStop. So they got to cover their bets and this Reddit community, they're putting a bunch of money in. So where I think what, what might be interesting when you're talking about that correlation with the atom bomb thingy, this, I mean, it won't be any deaths, but I think it could be some big financial numbers where I wonder if these hedge fund managers are going to have to cover their, their bets so that means they're going to take the money from their clients probably or their clients will lose out so it's it might be unfortunate that these 
Wall Street bets guys are giving the middle finger and making those hedge fund managers look bad right now. But maybe in the end, it might be at the cost of other people's investments, which I see both sides. I actually, I dislike more of the hedge fund managers and the abstraction layer of stocks. I dislike how it seems so far-fetched from everyday life and how it, it feels like it doesn't provide a service to society, in my opinion. I might be wrong on that. So meaning like me and you, we work in IT. We're providing yeah. a service. We're providing time that builds a service that helps somebody else out to do their job. And we make things um, streamlined for other people. Whereas I feel like Wall Street and that whole, all that of hedge fund managers, they're playing money on top of money on top of money, which it's you really could, weird. Yeah, you could take all that effort, all that knowledge, put it towards something else. Have them learn IT, have them learn programming, have them learn being a bake, baker, have them be a farmer, anything that produces something for society. Um, but maybe that's the strange thing with, I don't know, with the world, the way the world is, is going, like where abstract things tend to make more money, like TikTok and YouTube videos that are just for fun that don't teach anything. So, I, yeah, I don't yeah. know. Apparently the very first YouTube video, the very first YouTube video was filmed in San Diego at the zoo. Hmm. Interesting. Right. 2004, I believe. Interesting fact. Hmm. Uh, my, my answer to Quan's and then, um, tell me what you think of my answer. You could either, think I think it's wrong or whatever, whatever you want to say. I think Quan's question where he said, is it IT, is it that hard to un understand or people are being too lazy to understand IT, I think. Uh, so I actually think IT is getting so complicated that every job, every job has a black hole of knowledge. Like even bakery, I'm sure you could get in depth with flour with making dough with yeah. how much butter, how, how many hours to bake something before you take it out and boil it, or how much water, how, how the pH uh, balance of water could affect something. Um, yeah. The black hole with all jobs causes us to be nearly incapable of learning everything. And especially, I'm, I love like uh, astrophysics, and or I love space travel topics. And when yeah. I dive into those topics, it's a never ending black hole of knowledge. It's so that's, I mean, every career, every, every path seems to have that. I don't really have an answer. I think, I do think if people are going to be on their computer all day. If, if they work in Excel or email and they're going to be on their computer all day, it almost seems like it would behoove them to learn a little bit about computers. They don't have to become an expert. Just know that the black box on your desk <laughs> that your story where that lady didn't, she's trying to hit a power button or something and the computer wouldn't turn on. Maybe you yeah. should, maybe it would help to know that that's the, that box has your CPU and hard drive in there, maybe. Some of the users, when they're in their element, they're in their, their scripted role, they show up and everything is working the way it's supposed to. And they, they click here and they know a couple programs. They're, they're good to go. It's when things go wrong, usually at the hardware level, that's where they're completely lost. So you have some of those kinds of users. Then there's users who, um, like some of the developers we have supported. One guy deleted the start menu. <laughs> and he described, he was trying to de delete temporary files, like you know, a, a very routine maintenance thing to do on your, on your PC. And somehow he navigated from System32 to some kind of folder with a long string of numbers and just deleted it. Suddenly there's no start menu. So he calls us up and I'm like, 
you know, this 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 has to be a, a put on or a joke or something. But I go to his computer. Yeah, there's there's no start menu. There's nothing. No start menu. Nice. <laughs> so the, that's like the other extreme where they're they know a little too much. Ah, uh, they know enough to hurt themselves. Like the, to use the black hole of an analogy, like the internet. Sometimes I find there's too much information. You really it, it takes time to parse through all the forums and everything like that. And then like, well, that's sort of what I'm going through. I'm mean, not exactly the same. And then you, you look at the year and it's like from 10 years ago, like, well, that may not even work anymore. So I, I run into all sorts of those situations. Yeah. The black hole is a good analogy. I, uh, that reminds me of a random story, uh, on, uh, this will touch up on your statement of, um, Find out what the root problem is first before you, uh, before you, probably before you make any actions. I was working level one, uh, level one support at Johnson and John Johnson Pharmaceuticals back in 2005 or something. A user called in and says, Hey, I got this email that says I, I should, I have a virus that I should delete. And I was like, okay. <laughs> can you explain what you're looking at and what you're going to do? And they're like, well, it's telling me to go to this folder and look for this teddy bear icon and delete it. And it was stupid of me. This is my, I was stupid. I said, did you put it there? And they said, no. And I was like, okay, delete it then. They were in a system 32 folder with one of the primary windows. Uh, I think it was, I forget what file it was, but it did have a teddy bear icon that's made from that from Microsoft. They put it in there. And luckily, I think right after I said, go ahead. And the, the user actually was the one that said, are you sure? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. uh, I'm not sure, but I think you should delete it. And they, once again, they're like, well, I don't know if I should delete it. <laughs> and I'm glad they didn't. Later on, uh, I think level two support walked out to that computer because at that mm -hmm. time, I don't know why we, um, I think 2004, 2000, we didn't have remote desktops. That, that's how bad, how old, uh, <laughs> how old that's that, a while ago. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I couldn't remote desktop to see what they're looking at. So they had, to, they had to describe to me over phone. I was like, what does the teddy bear look like? How big is the icon? <laughs> <laughs> um, and level two support walked out there, looked at the computer like, oh yeah, they're sitting inside the system 32 folder. Um, hmm. They probably sh probably shouldn't delete anything in here. Then they looked at the email. They, then they were able to figure out, oh, this is one of those like um, uh, it was an attempt. I think that it was an email that was going to if you delete that file, then they could try to inject a, a virus into the from the email. Um, yeah. So any anyways, just a random story to your idea of uh, get it's to know the problem. To download more RAM. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know I've done that. Yeah, what's going on? What kind of company do you work for? It's a healthcare company. So they, not like a hospital, but there's like doctors and chiropractors there. There's um, a lot of the medical bureaucracy and the, the medical record stuff. And there's like call center people. There's a pretty substantially significant marketing department, PR, there's, um, there's a, like a legal part. So there's so many different cultures within the company. Like each department is its own culture and atmosphere. And I got to see all that by being in IT because I had to like run around everywhere. Like marketing was real fun. They're joking around. They're throwing like a little Nerf football at each other. And then you go to like this other com con department where it's a, they do a lot of reading of PDFs and legal stuff. And then someone, someone shushed me because I was still new and I, I didn't realize how loud I was being. So that the girl's like whispering to me and I, I'm just like, yep. And I you know, put my hand on the table, boom, that's broken. And some other girl's like, shh. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So like all these different departments have like a different, literally a different atmosphere and different culture and stuff like that. Hmm. Are you dealing with uh, patient information, or is it mainly the the people that deal with healthcare? You just deal with helping them with their just getting their system up and running, keeping them running. Yeah, 
Correct. Um, if I do see patient information, it's probably because I'm remoting and yeah, to that computer, and I'm trying not to look at it. But the uh, the security at this job is very, very tight, very intense. Yeah. So there's all these layers of of security in the environment, which adds more complexity to IT. Oh yeah. Um, for instance, all the USB ports are disabled. So that, that adds a layer of, um, and it affects me as well, like troubleshooting and stuff like that. So, and I found that there's an inverse relationship between security and convenience in that when you have more security, less convenience. When you got more convenience, much less security. It's sort of like a teeter-totter, like when one goes up, the other one goes down. So there's a lot of things that can be inconvenient at this company. And you just get used to it, it's the environment. What's your opinion on the USB um, disabling? At first it was challenging because at my old job, we were all about USB ports, installing software, USMT drives, and you can't do that. Our, and now you really can't do it because everyone's remote basically so but we we have workarounds so if if we really need to we can request of security to enable it temporarily and you have to specify the time for whatever, whatever reason like there's a certain kind of software i had to install and it's kind of an older financial software it's like almost like a legacy and I think it has to do with like reading checks or something like that. And you have to enable the USB, even though you're not plugging in anything at all to trick it or some drive to work. It's, it's weird. There's like 20 steps to the software. From the end user perspective, I imagine, I'm guessing all of them would say, damn, why are you, why are you disabling USB? Uh, have you had that conversation a lot at all? No, it's probably been like this for a long time. Yeah. People are um, very aware of the security. They're actually pretty glad it's secure. Like there are, there were no receptionists, there were security guards. Like, like I, I used to always see security guards at my old job and just see these guys walk around and they look kind of bored. I was like, man, that job looks so easy. Like, I've never seen a stressed out security guard ever. Then the company I'm at now, the security guards, it, there's a lot involved. There's people coming and going, they have to badge in, and there's actually two computers at the security desk, but one for the camera system, and there's another one for the badge system, and yeah, it's pretty intense. There's, there's, they're, they're very heavily involved. I, yeah. Didn't even realize that was a thing. I used to see security guards walking around parking garages at the mall, you know, the mall security guards. Yeah. Look pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah, I think the 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 statement of uh, it as a balancing act act between security and convenience, that's yes, Absolutely. The so like the password manager, I, I've tried to convince a few friends to jump on and do a password manager. And they're, they're, one of their concerns is that if they do this password manager, it's going to be like a one to two hour learning process just to set it up and do everything. And then what if the password manager, what if things change in a year or two and they have to relearn something new? which with password managers, I think for the last three years, I haven't seen anything change. Um, and to some degree, I think looking back at some of the other password, password managers I used before that, there hasn't been much change for the last, I don't know, five, 10, I don't know if I would say 10 years, but uh, eh, could be close to 10 years. But I haven't, I haven't personally used a password manager that long, only in the last, uh, probably about in the last, five years and then even more in the last three years yeah but uh, oh yeah so the 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 convenience and security the the couple of friends are like well is it really that convenient i 
some of the, I think both of them, I, I, I will not say their name, you know, but it's, it's almost, most people are like this. They have their Excel spreadsheet somewhere or they have a printout of the password written on paper somewhere. And that's, it's kind of scary to think that it's that easy for them to lose that piece of paper or, or someone yeah. to get a, a hold of that Excel file. Yeah, I'll, I'll get Facebook requests from somebody that's like already a friend and if they had to recreate a profile for some reason. Mm -hmm. And that, that's probably why they probably lost their password, not only to Facebook, but also to their email mm -hmm. that's connected to Facebook. So they got to do it all over again. Yeah. Um, that's probably why. Random story. Um, I had an email account uh, for Gosh, how long has it been? I think I was, I want to say I was 13 when I created that email account. And I want to say it was less than, less than seven years ago, I got an email. I think it's my secondary backup email on that account. And it says your password has been compromised. But so uh, 13 years old, so 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. I had the same password for 25 years. Oh, no, 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 sorry. That was five, seven years ago. So, um, so 18 years, I had the same password. It was, and it was an insecure password. It was uh, eight digits long. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just funny to think that that account went for 18 years before the password got compromised. But that's just, I mean, the nature of the internet, brute force, anything. It was, yeah. it was eight digits long. It was, it was silly for me never to have updated the password at that point. Granted, actually that became a backup email address. So that's probably why I didn't care about it. I didn't update the password. You never got prompted to change it. It was never any kind no, of- No, no, surprisingly, no. Uh, I'll, uh, it was a Hotmail, a Hotmail account. Yeah. yeah, they never told me to, at least, yeah, I never, it never told me to update the password. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so how's COVID uh, changed your job in IT? tremendously like it's turn it around flip it upside down back around uh I, I was more of like a hands-on technician where like someone will call and i'm like you know what let me just run upstairs and just take a look get my hands on it can't do that anymore i had to do a 180 in the way i worked and tremendously changed my job. Some people, their job is the same. They just do it at home. It's just they're in a different environment, that's all. For me, it's the environment and the content and the problems. Like one thing you have to consider in, in troubleshooting is someone's living situation. I have to bring that into the equation. Like I've been working with this user and her internet just keeps going in and out. Well, at least on the system, she has a, a virtual desktop. So all the programs, all the data is dependent on internet connection. So if there's any kind of disconnect at all, the screens flash black and then she gets her phone disconnects. It's a mess. It's been, it happens like every other minute. And we can tell on our end, she's oscillating between two and five megabits per second. She's had two technicians from the cable company come over. She's made the phone calls. Yeah, everything's fine on our end. She calls the ISP, but is it really fine? Like, I don't know that. So that just leaves her location as the only constant in this equation here. And there's just some places in the United States where the internet is just slow. It might, it might be that town or a neighborhood or just simply a house on that street the internet for whatever reason is just terrible and if people move and suddenly it's better so I, i'm always like troubleshooting their home internet connection stuff like that or their their significant other or their spouse like those this happened where she's like well my husband works from home to him and he hasn't complained and it turns out he was having problems he just wasn't saying anything so i had to like 
take all that in consideration, which is basically out of my control. So it's that's a big part of it. And of course, giving out your cell phone number to users, you know, breaking that rule, throwing it out the window. Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel that you're uh, <clears throat> a nerd on the uh, a nerd outside of work or or do you just work on your IT stuff at work and then when you get home you don't really want to deal with anything IT no no I work on IT stuff when I get home do you have any side projects uh, that you work on that's IT related uh, some Linux stuff um, I'm learning how to code Python slowly. oh nice <clears throat> book is like the the Gutenberg Bible. It's just like this thick. Mm. And it covers both 2x and 3x. So, and it's all over the place. Just and this this works in the new version. This doesn't work in the old version and vice versa and it's, it's all over the place. So, Ugh. I mean, I do do IT stuff in my personal life. I like to think I'm not a stereotypical IT guy. Um like I don't play video games at all. Like I just, when I told my coworker that, he was like, looked at me kind of funny. And You're not an IT guy. Any, any of the Marvel movies, and I even got a weirder look. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, tr I Googled the um, middle aged IT guy starter pack. I mean, you know the starter pack memes? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I make sure not to wear those clothes, not to have those shoes. <laughs> Just, and we all know people who who got that. You <laughs> start pack memes, and you immediately think of people you know. Yeah, yeah those are my favorite. <laughs> what are you doing in Linux? <clears throat> oh, just some programs, installing the OS. I, I like the operating system. I like how obscure it is, hmm. but it, it's still caught in that. That paradox of a lot of people don't use Linux because there's not enough software for it. Yeah. So those those people ask the software companies, why don't you make it for Linux? And they go, well, because not not people use Linux. So it's sort of like in this circle, like yeah. this paradox. Yep. Maybe over time, it'll become more uh, widespread. And yeah. More using it. Yeah. From I. I'm currently only using it for my Ethereum, um, <clears throat> uh, Ethereum mining yeah. um, PCs, Ethereum. Right. and uh, I want to say when I touched Linux Red Hat ten years ago, uh -huh. yeah, Red Hat. It, I don't, I don't remember it being as easy as Ubuntu is right now. Like when I install Ubuntu, it seems like so many things are so easy. Um, there is still a lot of, there's a, well, maybe cause I'm on the Ethereum doing the Ethereum stuff with it. Um, I still have to do quite a bit command line, mm -hmm. but I do see how much I'm able to do with just the, uh, the GUI, which I'm really surprised. I, I feel like Ubuntu and I'm assuming Red Hat's probably the same. I think, I bet you they're pretty similar. Um, the amount yeah. of things you could do through the GUI is pretty amazing. Yeah. I have a bad habit of um, someone will tell me, like, a friend of theirs or whatever, they'll go, whatever you do, do not ask them this question or don't talk about this. Right? So I I, I instantly want to go there. I want to ask that person that question. So there was this guy, I mean, old job, there was this guy. He looked like a hippie kind of guy from Berkeley. And I was told this guy is a, he's a he's a Linux guru, but whatever you do, do not ask him about Ubuntu, because he'll just like explode. <laughs> so I saw him in the hallway once, and I, I just started talking about Linux and stuff. And then I'm like, so Ubuntu, what do you think of that? And he's he's just like Ubuntu sucks. I mean, he just like, walks away and just you know he Damn. storms off. I'm like, oh, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I think it's because to the hardcore Linux, it kind of represents simplicity. It represents uh, more 
more emphasis on the gooey and more of like a watered down version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I could totally, when I, okay, I agree with that. When I, when I start to some degree, as I was doing all the things I had to do to get the Ethereum mining and uh, software going and everything, I, I wanted to set up alerts, um, email alerts, and all this stuff monitoring. But as I was doing it and installing all these things, I noticed, or in my mind, it literally was thinking like, huh, this is starting to feel a lot like Windows and I, it, it feels like away from Linux. So I, I totally could understand that. Um, but like, but, what was that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And like you're saying to the paradox of that, I totally agree. Um, you got the paradox of less users, but now it's a little bit more user friendly in Ubuntu. I'm guessing Lin I'm guessing Linux is similar, but I don't know. I haven't touched a Red Hat or I haven't yeah, I haven't touched uh I don't know of just the what would you call it, the baseline of uh Linux or a Linux install. I haven't played with Linux itself for a while. Um so I could definitely feel that with Ubuntu. I think as I sit there installing things and it feels more like Windows, I'm also feeling that maybe this is starting to, what if, what if Ubuntu is capturing data, like how, how Microsoft's tele telemetry does with, when you type on the keyboard, like it records everything from my, to my understanding. I don't know how much, but I hear it records everything. Um, and then, and you see it on Windows when you install Windows, man, it wants to, it's like, do you want to report your, all your debugging issues? Do you want to report your date time? Do you want to report your system specs to Windows, uh, to Microsoft and all, all the, like, I mean, it's, it's like, like four pages of questions when you install Windows, it seems like, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, an, it's crazy. Yeah. Windows is like, if your girlfriend or boyfriend moves in and then you have all this stuff that you, you didn't know about in yeah. the whole space, you're just like, yeah, yeah. Wow! Like, look at all. Where are we going to put all this stuff? It's going to use up all this space. Yeah, that's exactly what it's like. Yeah, yeah. I remember back in what freaking uh, Windows. I think it's Windows XP. I think the installation file was like seven hundred megs. I think the installation files. Um, you're looking at I think like seventy gigs on Windows ten right now, somewhere around there. Does that? Uh, it might go down to 20 or 30. I might be wrong on that, but I think I've seen yeah. some installations in the 70 gig mark. Um, that that's, seems insane, but... Those of updates, the periodic updates, I'll take more space. Yeah, yeah. What's your opinion on COVID and how, how do you think things are going to play out nationally with this? So meaning, I hope COVID is a... I personally hope COVID is a catalyst to get everyone to actually stay at home working. Do you think it's going to stay that way or do you think it's going to come, everyone's going to eventually come back into the office once COVID is subsided? I think some people are going to come back. Some people are going to stay home. I've talked to people, there's probably about 15 people off the top of my head that would jump to go back into the office for a variety of reasons you know maybe they don't have the workspace they're like set up on the kitchen table or something and their kids are also doing online schooling and that's a distraction i think some people hopefully when the numbers go down things open up some people will go back some people will want to stay home some people love working from home others not so much it, maybe it's part because it, they're forced to do it and it doesn't feel like a, a privilege because if, if you get to work from home but none of your coworkers can, it, you feel kind of privileged to so. You enjoy it more, but if you're forced to do it, here's your equipment, you have to work from home from, from now on. Plus, with the lockdown, everything's closed. You can't go out. So that doesn't make people feel good. So I think in the future, some people will go back simply because of the living, living situation and some people will just stay home. What do you, what's your guess on what's the percentage? Uh, 
30 people, 30% of people will stay home and 70% back in the office or 50-50? Probably. It's, it's, it's much higher than, than you would think. Some, uh, some people think everyone loves working from home, but I, I'm talking to these people, I'm helping them out, and that's clearly not the case. They're stressed out. Some people get panicked. They get anxiety by looking at cables that are unplugged. Hmm. The one user was having problems, just getting stressed out looking at unplugged cables. He's like, I hate cables, I don't want to look at them. So I, yeah, again, had to give him my number and text me pictures of show him to plug in. It's, it's hard to advise someone how to plug something in without talking down to them. It's, you, have to, you have to be very, very careful. It's like, you see the hole and you see the plug they they go together like that you can't you can't do that you can, they're not children you have to like make it fun like a game almost but it's very very tricky the plugs have like the same color like usually the say vga has a blue with 15 pins yeah. and is a trapezoid it only fits one way <laughs> that's yeah. funny yeah and then like usb only has one way it goes in it's it's uh yeah but yeah definitely there'll be 25, 30 percent of people will will want to go back. Uh, I I still have to go in once a week to do stuff that I can only do there, like new hire builds and stuff like that. And there's actually a few people who have refused to work from home, but luckily they do a lot of printing at their job, and so they're allowed to stay. Huh. What if if you had to guess what percentage would your office turn out to be in uh, say two years from now? What do you think will be the percentage in the office and what percentage will stay home? I'm gonna go sixty forty. Sixty percent at home, oh, wow. forty percent at, at the office. That's hmm. my Okay. That's my guesstimation. So I have this uh I, I'm very optimistic and I'm optim optimistic often and not enough realistic sometimes. So I have this desire that I want this COVID situation to get people to work at home more. And I wish people use, and I don't think this will happen, but I hope it does, where instead of commuting to work where you lose like 30 minutes on the road, 30 minutes each way or an hour each way, yeah. uh, if you got a get dressed to business attire and that might save you 15, 10, to 20, 10 to 30 minutes depending on the person. And maybe for women with makeup, maybe they'll save even more time. So if you accumulate the amount of time that you're at work, well, if you were to go to the office, how much time you would save working at home? Like maybe, I hope between maybe two hours, let's just say two hours per day. I hope that companies don't try to swindle people into saying, hey, we're going to pay you less because you will work at home or you're going to have to work an extra two hours because you're saving two hours a day. Um, but so in my optimistic world, companies realize their employees are happier and producing more work at home. And then those people get two extra hours to spend time with their family. I'm hoping it'll be better for our society, but I, I I don't know. Who knows how it's going to end out in two years, five years from now. Um, I hope that this work at home thing becomes more common, but I, I totally understand what you're saying. There's certain people that can't do it. I, yeah. I don't know what to say about those people. I hope that maybe, maybe they could find a, a, a balance between zoom meetings. If that's what they need people interaction, because I don't, I kind of, I kind of don't need people interaction that much. I would prefer people interaction at night when we're having fun with friends and stuff. But yeah, when yeah. it's at the job, just give me some code. If I uh, give me my projects, I'll code it out. If I need to talk to somebody, I'll email that team, that manager, that department. Hey, my code's going to do this. Is your department ready to handle this? I'm okay with the dig digital answers. I don't really need them to. I don't need to see their facial reaction about some software thing. Right. Um, so anyways, that's, yeah, I, I hope things go that way for the positive, but who knows? Yeah, me too. 
how are people handling working remotely from home? Um, I, you, you kind of already answered that. Is there anything else uh, you want to add to it at all? And it's okay if you don't want to. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, um, I talked to one person, she hasn't left her house since March. Mm. So I, I told her, you better drive your car around the block a few times. Oh, oh, that much. Like she's not even like I could still, uh, I I'm, I'm pretty careful with the COVID situation. So I'm, I'm at home when I go out to the grocery store, that's it. Go out to mm -hmm. that, wear a mask. Um, the only activities I got is like going out to a park, walking around, um, went camping last year in Yellowstone, but, um, hopefully uh -huh. once weather comes, uh, gets nicer, I'll, I'll schedule some more camping trips. But I think camping seems to be the only activity that feels somewhat safe. It's outdoors. Um, I think that seems to be the only thing that kind of helps, in, in my opinion, uh, from what I think of COVID. Like even being indoors per prolonged amount, uh, if you're indoors with other people and you don't live with those people, if you're indoors at a restaurant, I feel like that just, even with a mask, and how are you going to eat with, without, uh, with a mask? So, or going, I guess going, if you want to go to the mall, but you're still indoors. At least you're wearing a mask. I don't know. I feel a little bit sketchy. For me, I, I don't. I don't like the numbers, especially when I hear the recent ten percent of of permanent um, issues. Uh, what do they call long haulers? COVID yes, long yes. haulers. Ten percent seems seems like a high. The fatigueness, the brain fog, people reporting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That doesn't sound fun. No, no, and yeah. And if it lasts, some of them are reporting more than four months, more than five months. That sounds terrible. So some of them don't even know when, when the end is so far, if that does go away or if that's truly permanent. That sounds crazy. Um, what's your thoughts on are people leaving California and or San Diego? So I've been, um, a lot of the users I've been helping are moving out of California. Not just San Diego, but just out of California. So, all over. We're talking Nevada. We're talking Arizona. We're talking about Florida. Another one, you know, Texas, of course, and Idaho. And the, the primary factor is just cost. Because if you move to a lower cost of living area, but your sal salary is the same, that's effectively... Uh, an increase that's, a, that's like a raise mm -hmm. so that's happening i think some people get kind of burned out with the fast-paced life of southern california because i don't work at a tech company it's like a healthcare company so they're not some some users aren't quite used to the fast pace of southern california because and i can tell from what they talk about and when I travel, like I went to Hawaii a few years ago, and you can just tell in the air, it's just a mellow place. Like I felt weird. I felt like I was in a hurry all the time. Like they had a a minimum speed limit. Like you can only legally drive so slow. I remember seeing those signs. I was like, I thought that was funny, but so that could be a factor. They just want a quieter, slower pace, more peaceful life, but. Yeah, they're, they're leaving California. I know it's a big issue right now. I don't think it, they're deliberately like moving to other states for political reason. It's just the number one reason to save money. That's why. Have you heard of companies charging or it, they say if you work at home, they will uh, bring your pay down. Have Have you seen that in your company or have you seen that in? No, what they started doing, what they, they started reimbursing people for their internet, stuff like that. Oh. At the very beginning, they weren't doing that. Oh, wow. Okay. Because internet for some of the users, like, I don't know their financial situation, but some people, their living situation kind of came to light and it wasn't really an ideal thing. They were like sharing a room with somebody in a house or something and they couldn't quite afford internet because internet can be between 50 to 150 dollars a month stuff like that yeah but they they have not lowered their pay at all that i know of okay yeah i've heard um 
I think I only read an article that said companies are are offering less money for uh, new hires that are working remotely. And I see. Huh. That, that's, it sounds unfortunate, but I wouldn't tell the company at, that I'm interviewing at if, I, if that was the situation. Yes, I would, have, I would take less pay for remote work because like I said, you're saving the commute time, you're saving the time being at work, you're saving the time um, getting dressed for work. Um, and your home environment should hopefully be really relaxing. If it's not, then maybe you got to figure out something else for yourself. Um, meaning if, if they have kids at home, then maybe that's a different story, but maybe they should, if they have kids at home, they maybe carve something out somehow have tell mom that she's got to take care of the kids between those working hours. Um, and then close the door, the dad, if it, or whoever, whether the mom's working or the dad's working, but they be, be able to close the door and nobody should be able to um, um, disturb them during those work hours. That's easy, yeah. probably easier said than done. But, but anyways, yeah, I think home should be a, a place that you're comfortable with. And that's something I'm willing to pay more for. Um, I mean, a simple thing as going to the, going to the restroom, like if you get your own toilet, I'd rather go in my own toilet than go at a company toilet. <laughs> like that's yeah. worth that worth that's worth a couple of dollars a month to me. <laughs> yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. I mean, it's like right there too. <laughs> yeah, you know when no one's in there, <laughs> you have to knock. Yeah. Out of how many people? So I was going to ask: Are there still people who have no internet? Uh, that that was a question that you wrote down for yourself. But how many? How many? What percentage was that? 5% of the users at work, 2%, just kind of a ballpark. I would say, let's go with, yeah, 5%. 5%, seriously? Yeah. Holy shit, I was thinking you're going to say like half of a percent. 5%, Jesus Christ. More than I thought, more than you would expect. Damn, freaking stone ages, like these people need to, <laughs> need to get with the future. <laughs> yeah, and... and they get by, yeah. Like bills and everything. There's. I, I guess they won't hear about Game Stock, Game Game Stop stock until the next day when they get into the office. I guess. <laughs> yeah. What kind of infrastructure challenges come from switching to remote work? Well, s security. So there's um, there's some departments where they kind of like call centers, and they they're privy to a lot of personal information. And this call center environment is very strict, very rigid. Like their their breaks are all pre-planned. Like tomorrow, you, you're going on a break at nine thirty-seven until nine fifty-two. Like if, if they if they clock in a minute later than their shift, they have to like sign some kind of attendance form, whatever. It's very strict. Um, they were not allowed to use cell phones at their desks. Their cell phones could not be at their desks because they were trying to avoid a, a, a situation where someone could take a screenshot of some uh, personal information. Uh, I don't know if it ever actually happened, but there's like these very strict industry regulation rules. But now all those all those people are at home. So and I asked like one of the managers like how did how are you dealing with that? The no cell phone at your desk rule. And as, at this point, it's the strictly the honor system. Mm. You know what I mean? Totally, yeah. So, and you still go into the office now, but about once a week? Yeah, and it's pretty crazy, believe it or not. Because I'm. what happens is I'm the only one there where my boss will be there. And there's stuff that I know I got to work on. And then I get texts from all these my coworkers, hey, are you in sight? Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do this? Can you do that? Uh, uh, and it's almost like a different job. So I have to like ignore everything I've done the day before. And I have people, I'll, I'll have like seven people messaging me on Microsoft Teams at once. They're trying to call me, but I'm not logging my phone. I'm literally not even my desk. I'm running around kind of like how it was before. Only it's very strict with the protocol of COVID. You have, to, you have to wear a mask. You can only go to the bathroom that's on your floor. Everything's like color coded. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so like, like I said, the security of this place is very, very strict. A user cannot just show up randomly. They have to get approval from HR 
to pick up a bad cube, like a replacement keyboard or mouse or whatever. Yeah. So they've really tightened this place down pretty well, but mm. for a good reason. And there's been no outbreaks at my work that I know of. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. Are more companies going to be moving out of California? Probably. That's been happening in Silicon Valley. I mean, I know Tesla moved to Texas and uh, some other companies. Apparently what's also happening is like, because the Bay Area is more expensive than San Diego. Uh, so some people were expecting housing prices to drop in San Diego. The opposite has happened. They were shot up again. Supposedly I've been hearing that Bay Area tech workers are moving out of the Bay Area to San Diego and are working remotely from their new house in San Diego. So that's happening as well. Yeah, yeah, I've but, heard that. You know, all my life, companies have always moved out of California. Like, I remember when I was a kid, there was a company called Buck Knives, where they made knives. It was in Santee, remember? Uh, huh. Yeah, I don't remember Buck Knives. It was like, they were kind of, there was like that area between El Cajon and Santee where there was like, yeah, yeah. Was like grass, there was like coyotes over there. Yeah. Like the place where they, uh, that has Phil's Barbecue right now? Is that the area? Is that the area? No, no, this is like by, over by Weld. You remember where Weld was? Like Fletcher Hills? Anyway. Oh, okay. It was like a, it was a San Diego company, family owned, been there for like decades, and they just packed up and moved to Idaho. But that was, quite, that was a long time ago. So as far as I can remember, companies have always moved out of San Diego. And I remember like going to Washington State as a kid back in like, you know, 1985 or 86. And then someone saw our car's California plates and they, they flipped us off. Oh, so my geez. dad had explained to a three-year-old what the finger meant. Yeah. My dad explained a lot of Californians in the early 80s moved to like Washington and allegedly raised the housing prices up in Washington State and the locals didn't like that. Yeah. Huh. That happened. Just like a resistance. So, in a way, it's always been happening as long as I can remember. Yeah. Whether Texas, Idaho, Arizona, Nevada, Oregon, Washington. Is the social isolation from quarantine going to cause people in the future to migrate away from social media and pursue more in person events? Probably. I think people, some people are, are experiencing the lack of interpersonal communication and being in the presence of another person at an event, like being at a brewery or at, or at a concert, like, um, like this with cell phones at concerts, it's, it seems like a lot of people weren't really taking in the music. They weren't really listening to the, the music. They were like recording it with their phone. So it's more, they want to record themselves at the event rather than being present at the event and enjoying the event. Know what I mean? So maybe after quarantine, people will realize maybe I should be more present. I suppose so. Yeah, um, probably bars and uh, music events. Music events. So I, yeah. I imagine that's going to be like festivals. Those things are going to probably go large after this quarantine. Um, and even actually like watching certain talks with the. Uh, um, uh, f s psychologists they're thinking yeah. that um, it'll be interesting if there will be a um, like after World War was it World War II the baby boom <laughs> people are going to be producing mm -hmm. a bunch of babies after this quarantine so it'll be the co post COVID uh, baby boom um, oh, the generation <laughs> yeah um, yeah I don't I don't know don't I haven't really thought that far into it as in people in isolation. I notice I have talked to some people and I've heard from other friends too. say you talk to someone that's been staying at home a lot. When you talk to them, they're like, they just talk, 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 talk. They're like, they're like, <clears throat> they need somebody to talk to because they've been in isolation. Um, um, do you remember Jeff? Jeff, I think is, uh, I'm not, hopefully I'm not saying his last name incorrectly from high school, Jeff uh, Roke. But yeah, I recently, call him Rokey. huh? Like Jeff 
Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I talked to him recently, and he 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 said he's been in quarantine in the Philippines. The, the government's fully locked down over there. So when he talked to me, he's like, "Hey, sorry, I don't know if I'm just talking really fast because I've been in quarantine. I got nobody to talk to you in, in yeah. English too." So, <laughs> so I had he, um, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I had a neighbor before, before all this, mm -hmm. he started working from home and he flagged me down outside and I was walking my dog and he invited me inside. He had grown these tall tomato plants on his balcony and he was just talking like super fast <laughs> about his tomato plants. Ooh, tomatoes, do you want to use tomatoes? <laughs> Who uses tomatoes? <laughs> he got this, like, this plastic grocery bag and he just filled them with these tomatoes, which were pretty jumbo. I was impressed, but he was just like, he had holes in his shirts and stuff and I remember thinking, like, I don't think he's gotten out in a while. <laughs> he was just nothing, just all about his tomatoes, man. Huh. I wonder what that's going to do. I feel like I don't get that. I haven't gone that way. So maybe I'm more introverted than I think, or I'm, I'm better suited for cabin life for whatever reason. I don't know. I wonder what that's going to do to the masses of people that that have this cabin fever, cabin fever, a uh, quarantine uh, cabin fever. That'd be interesting how America turns out, or or the rest of the world, all the, the entire world. Uh, I don't know what to think about it. Hmm. Interesting. We'll probably see it already. All the effects of it. Uh. What habits do you do daily that greatly imp impact your life? I've been drinking a lot of water. I've been trying not to follow the news a lot because it's either COVID, riots, politics, and divisiveness. And divisiveness. And sometimes I feel like the media is like a really gossipy friend that just makes things worse sounding than they actually are that that could be the case or those they really are that bad so i try not to just follow that as much and just keep my head clear and just stay productive and i usually go out running for like a mile every other night that helps me sleep yeah yeah the news thing to too much you know yeah the news thing um, for quite a long time, almost almost to a negative effect, a negative effect to me. I stayed away from news because that's how I felt of news for as far as long as I could remember. I think probably I don't know, maybe it was twenty four, twenty five, twenty six years old, where I, I remember saying. Yeah, I don't listen to the news because it's just all bad news. It's yeah. and some of the bad news doesn't even seem fully true. It's gone worse now. That news from when I was twenty five, so we're twelve years later. I feel like it's even worse. The news is sensationalized every single thing that's bad because that's what gets viewership. Um, and it doesn't even have to be true news. And and then on top of that. The causing of divisiveness it seems so extreme i don't know what to think about it too i hope humans figure out a way to use the internet for the better and not for the worse i i don't have an answer um as as we grow in all sorts of information knowledge it gets deeper and deeper bakeries get deeper and deeper um, plumbing gets deeper and deeper. It's tougher to know what's right on the other side. So if I'm a programmer, maybe plumbing has some innovation that they say is good to do something. I don't know if it's true and divisiveness can just make that worse. I, I don't know, man. It, it is, it's scary to think about the near future. And then take it with politicians and lobbying and the, the country's not getting any better. You know, the thing though, it's odd when you take it down to the human level, if me and you sit here and have a good conversation, I could take this conversation, I could, whether it be you or my neighbor, neighbor, 
I actually, sadly, I don't even know who my neighbor is. My neighbors, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know. I don't. What is that? Is that the American way? I don't know. Do most people not know their neighbors? I think that's, that's our generation. That's our generation. Hmm. I think we're a bit more millennials because you and I were, we're the older millennials. I think millennials 1980, I believe. That's the cutoff. Okay. And our generation is. I mean, we grew up with stranger danger. Don't talk to strangers. Yeah. That's strange, very bad. So we grew up with that. So maybe compared to some of my older neighbors who are always trying to flag me down. But yeah, but I think I, maybe we're a little more closed off. Maybe I am. You know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. If we could use the internet to get people to be more trustworthy of each other, but that's not happening. The internet oh. makes us more fearful, man. <laughs> so apparently, the number one scandal on the internet are is romance scam, where, um, and this happened to a very intelligent person. Like I think she was like an intelligence agent from the government, where some met some guy on a dating website, but it was someone in a different country using someone else's picture. And he suddenly he messages her, oh, I'm in a lot of trouble. I need a few hundred dollars. And she would just send him money. Mm. And so that doesn't help with the trust, the trustworthiness. So there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll read these stories. I'm just like, come on, man. Really? I mean, dude, come on. <laughs> the I don't know if it's a... Uh... Like people, people to people, when we, when we talk to each other, it seems like those barriers are shut down. Maybe the internet has that barrier and everyone gets to be all crazy. Or maybe, maybe peer, person to person, maybe, maybe when I talk, when I sit and talk with somebody, maybe after I'm done talking with them, maybe their crazy self comes out because they know that if they're talking to me in person, maybe they can't uh, say all the, all their thoughts. But for example, now, I, I know this could be easily, I know the factors in this, as in when I go take an Uber, an Uber, a Lyft, I, I'm very talkative, so I talk to them. And I want to say 9 out of 10 or even higher, probably 99 out of 100 times, they're pretty freaking cool people. Like, um, yeah. Now, yeah. I know that they're doing a job, so maybe they're trying to play into my personality and they're trying to just say things that they think is um that would interest me but some of the conversations get pretty deep like uh i think i had one uber driver where i started talking about, i have i have this fascination with north korea i think it's the worst country in the world right and i watch a lot of documentaries i'm a i'm a weirdo i watch a lot of documentaries to learn about north korea and why it got so yeah, bad ice is a really good one Yes, yes, I've watched, I've watched all, all, all of those because uh, they, they've done multiples. I think Shane's gone back to, Vi uh, to North Korea twice where I don't understand how, I think the first time he got, ban he got banned or kicked out, or not kicked out, he got banned or they said don't come back. And he Is came back. The long hair? Is that the guy with the long hair who got drunk in the hotel room? What, did he have long hair in that one? Um, yeah. I don't remember. I don't know. I remember the, the he got drunk on the train, and I'm pretty sure he got drunk in the hotel room. So, um, yeah, he was drunk. That's for sure. <laughs> so with the Uber driver, I started mentioning North Korea, and that person started shouting off, "Oh, did you see this documentary? Oh, did you mm -hmm. see this?" I'm like, "Oh, dude, this guy has the same weird uh, interest in North Korea that I do." Yeah. So, so it's so. Anyways, what I'm getting at is. It's interesting that we could talk to so many people in person and they seem pretty cool. But yet when it goes online, man, it turns into a toxic world. Yeah. YouTube comments. Oh, oh yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Look out. Huh. I, I, I don't know. I don't know where this is all going with the internet and humans. One thing you're, that makes me more go. You're saying it's you're hoping humans find a a way to make life better. Yeah, but I, I would, I'm actually gonna say maybe worse. Maybe the internet is bringing out our true personalities, our true animal instincts, our true thoughts. Maybe we are all this sick inside. 
<laughs> and uh, the internet just brings that all out. I, th I think it depends on the arena. So under the cloak of being anonymous, like the YouTube comments, people can be pretty vicious. I mean, very vicious and just with the comments and insulting. But if you put those same people in person in a room, I highly doubt they would be that vicious to each other. So I think it depends on the, on the arena. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really good point. Why do people find that the online arena, why do they find that their cloak makes the, why do they have to bring out all the bad colors when they have a cloak on? Yes, yeah, uh, why? Yeah. Um, what do you know about Vietnamese culture or do you know anything about the Vietnamese culture? I know, I, I know a little bit. I know, um, like my uncle was in the Vietnam War, so mm. I always heard his perspective of Vietnam from, from being, being there at the war. And it definitely changed him because he had someone, maybe in his unit, was always saying, um, when I get back home, I'm going to buy this thing and that thing. He saved up all of his money. But that guy ended up being killed. And so my uncle realized, from now on, I'm going to blow my whole paycheck, everything. I'm mm. not saving anything because I yeah. might die today. I don't know. Yep. And he, he never got out of that mindset. Mm -hmm. So... so I mean, our high school was, I would say, upper middle class, predominantly white. Mm -hmm. And there was you and there was... I want to say like four, four other Asian people <laughs> out of, out of uh, uh, 2000, was it? <laughs> right. Compared to people I knew who went to like Kearney High School, where it's probably 70% Asian. You've got Filipino, Vietnamese, you've got Lao. So I... It wasn't until I was like 18 that I really ventured out into Convoy. Oh, okay, okay. Trying some Vietnamese cuisine and yeah, I, I pronounce pho as pho and you're like rolling your eyes. Whatever. <laughs> wow, you actually know how to say it correctly though. Pho, yeah, pho. that's awesome. And then I was like, all right, I'll, I'll see what this is all about. And I got to go and I noticed it was the, the, the pho thai, it was the, the real thin steak. Yeah. And I went, so over my container, I'm like, wait a second, it's raw. <laughs> but then I realized the soup was so, I mean, it was scalding. It was yeah. So I couldn't roll the container without burning my yeah. hands. And I'm like, oh, I get it. I have to put that in the soup. Yeah. And I mix everything together. So my, my introduction to Vietnamese culture was a few Vietnamese people I knew at Mesa College and then getting Vietnamese food and stuff like that. I, I got the impression that in Vietnamese culture, and maybe I'm wrong, but they, they tend to eat meals together. Is that right? Yeah, yep, yep. Okay, that, that would because I went to this, this, there's a restaurant convoy, I think it's called Phuong Trang or Phuong Trang. Phuong Trang, yeah, yeah, yep. I went there. It's a great the restaurant. restaurant. Oh, have you have you tried the, the garlic bar butter wings there? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so I go there and it's like packed, you know, and there's like big round tables of whole families sitting around and talking to each other, sharing a, a big fish. And I go there and I'm like, yeah, I'm just, I was like, how many? I'm like, just one. She's like, just one? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and they, they sat me way on the side of this table, uh. like, like they're making me feel even worse. Uh. Then I, look, I looked around and I was like, wow, maybe it's more of a ritual thing. I think getting food by yourself may not be what we're supposed to do. I know it's a lot um, of right? No, I wouldn't say. Um, getting food by yourself um, in Vietnam, well, culturally, I think it just depends. Like, they're, they're probably that restaurant is so family oriented. So that's probably why. That could like, be it too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say certain other restaurants where it's more known that uh, somebody comes in during lunch, they'll come by themselves. Um, that might be more common. Um, but the the lunch the meals in vietnamese culture it's it's quite beautiful the i live i i went there for six months in 2010 
And then I went yeah. there six for six months a year ago, a year and a half ago. And the first time seeing it's it's not seeing it the, uh, it's not seeing it the first time it's seeing it the f- seeing it for two weeks straight seeing mm-hmm. it for two months straight where every lunch family will come home they'll they'll spend an hour two hours from work they'll come home they'll sit with the family everyone eats together um, yeah. that's actually a beautiful thing I the, the family factor. I do appreciate the independence that my American culture has brought in me. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But I do love the family feeling there in Vietnam. So I, it's a little bit of a, I'm torn on being so much, so intertwined with family, but I also love my independence. So there, there, there's a delicate balancing act with that. Yeah. So lunch over there is two hours sometimes. And, I mean, you might have, you know, 13 people for lunch. You got your uncle, cousins, everyone. It's fantastic. Everyone sits down together and eats together. And, and some of one of the um, cultural things is if you want to show respect or love to somebody, you grab a piece. So usually it's small, small bowls of rice. And then you got in the center, you have your meat, your veggies, your soup. So you'll, you'll use your chopsticks and put a piece of meat in their bowl as a sign of respect or love. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing to, when you, when I was there for six months, you, it starts to morph at first, you know, I'm like, Hey, this is my own bowl. Like, I, I don't care you for you touching your chopsticks and my food or whatever, but oh, I see. Yeah. it starts to morph and you see it, you feel it. And it, it, it's a beautiful thing. Um, Interesting. It's almost, it's too bad. Uh, you, uh, the first time you had foe was by, uh, that you ordered to go by yourself. It's too bad. Somebody didn't kind of walk you through the ropes, like uh, ropes. Uh, like I usually, when I introduce someone new to pho, I'll, I'll, I'll tell them, Hey, this hoisin sauce, it's this brown sauce. That's like sweet flavored, like barbecue sauce kind of, or teriyaki. Um, yeah. you know, take a spoonful of the broth, taste the broth without the hoisin and then try a little bit with the broth in your spoon, put a little hoisin, mix it up, try it out, see if you like that flavor. Um, and some people like to throw the veggies in and some people don't. Um, nowadays, what, what do you, how do you eat your pho? Like, do you throw a bunch of veggies in? Yeah, I'm all about veggies. I, I actually made my own pho one time. Oh, shit. And uh, how did scratch. It was, it was good. It wasn't phenomenal, but it was good. And... I remember telling somebody in my work that I had, I had this thing boiling, on like a low boil for like eight hours. Oh yes. I'm like eight hours, and my my coworker goes, "That's it. You should boil longer." And I'm like, "Oh, really? Like wow." Huh. Um. I hear minimum of like four hours. Uh, I haven't I haven't heard someone say longer than eight, but I think the thing with with broth though the longer you do it the better the the flavors that's from it. That's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah i would say minimum of four from what i hear the longer you could do the better it is what other uh dishes do you so that's your favorite vietnamese dish pho that's my favorite absolutely yeah and what what's your second favorite uh my second favorite would have to be the garlic butter chicken. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I I don't know if that's actually a stereo uh, a uh, tradition. Yeah, I don't think that's a traditional dish. Though, um, actually, my uh, my family in Vietnam they they did make that dish actually. So I don't know. Um, I'm not sure if they just they picked that up recently. I'm assuming, or if they if they've done that dish for a very long time. Um, there's a version of that dish where they do uh, a f- fish sauce. Um, it's fish sauce fried chicken wings. Um, I think they'll fry it first, and then they'll make a sweet, uh, sweet tangy fish sauce that that's uh, right. like caramelized, and they'll add that mm-hmm. on top of the wings. It's delicious. Oh yeah, <clears throat> I've made a pad thai lately, and it comes out pretty good oh nice that's awesome that you're exploring all all different uh um foods 
are you dabbling in other other races too, like uh, say Indian food or Mediterranean food? I can make really good kind of Spanish style. It's, a, it's called a tortilla, but in Spain, it's like a bunch of eggs mixed with like potato slices and becomes like this big thing. And I'm really good at that. Nice. Nice. I was thinking about making Indian, but the like chicken tikka masala, there's like, must be like 11 different spices. Yeah. Probably it's like tricky. 50 million spices. <laughs> it's so, it's so good yeah. though. Uh, so good. <laughs> what do you know of cryptocurrency and, or what do you think of it? I like it. I, I think, I think it's one of those things where it's been waiting to be invented. It was just a matter of timing for someone to kind of pick it up and actually create it and implement it. Sort of like the internet. The time was just, just right. So it's interesting that it's not really being utilized the way it was intended. Like it was supposed to be a, a digital currency, a decentralized international digital currency, not tied by any government or any kind of like bank or anything like that. But what, what, what's happening is that people are using it as a store of value. So they're, they're buying it, not to use it, they're buying it to like hold on to it. I have like a little bit, I got in too late, so huh. I mean, even, even Dogecoin's up, who would have guessed that? <laughs> uh, my theory on that statement of I got in too late, my theory, and I could be wrong, I'm not a financial advisor, mm -hmm. but we probably have something, actually, we could probably guess uh, I'm gonna, if there's it's a hundred, uh, a hundred, I think there's $1 trillion in, in cryptocurrency right now, market cap, 1 okay. trillion, because it's like stocks where the last purchase price is the price of all the coins. So it's a compounding, eh, I, I don't, compounding is not the right word, but conceptually. So if you bought ethereum for four hundred dollars and now it's 13 but the value is at 1300 but you bought it for 400 and if you just keep on holding the value may go up so every coin is now worth 1300 even though a lot of people bought maybe at 400 but every coin yeah. now and there's a lot of people that bought at 13 dollars. there's people that bought at 50 dollars. um so there's a weird there's probably a word for it. I don't know it. I'm too stupid. Um, there's probably a word where all those coins, that market cap. So if you take $1 trillion, you could probably guess there's probably was only $1 billion worth of money that purchased it. I, I don't know. I don't know the numbers. Maybe $1 billion or $10 billion. Um, so it's a fraction of the $1 trillion. Now... If we, let's just say, let's say on the high, let's say on the high, let's say 100 billion, $100 billion is in the system. But if you take, I think M3 money, M3 money at $75 trillion, M3 money, I think is, uh, it's cash money, liquid money, like cash in your wallet, but it's also your bank account. It's also credit cards and also home loans. So as the government prints money too. So all these factors, like there's layers M1, M2, M3 money. So I think if I remember correctly, M3 is at 75 trillion. And we only have maybe a hundred billion dollars that's in cryptocurrency, even though the market cap says a trillion. I wanna actually probably say yes, I, I, or less. I probably wanna guess there's $10 billion of M3 one or m0 money either way there's still a lot of money that could come into cryptocurrency so that's my argument on saying if people do think that they got in too late i think it's still not too late um i suggest people to buy in still um the other thing i haven't sold it yeah the other thing is um when you say when uh 
people think about Satoshi Nakamoto that mentioned um, it should be a global currency. I think blockchain brings about something even more, even bigger than money. It brings about the ability of truth by consensus. That is such a powerful thing that I see yes. in my eyes that people don't consider when they look at cryptocurrency. And I do think that you have to have money on the line for this. For consensus of truth, you have to have money on the line because the servers have to get paid for their work. And the beauty of cryptocurrency is the beauty of this decentralized network they will usually charge the cheapest price to do your transaction. There, there's probably a bit of conversation that you could have on that topic. Is it the cheapest? I, I think it is. It, it, but anyways, for, the, for this conversation. So you could have a truth factor through blockchain for the cheapest amount possible by consensus. Those are very important things like if you have a government that wants to put out a law and they're going to put out a law in writing that says whatever the law is, you can't wear red shirts. Say that's the law. That's the law. Yeah. You put out that on the blockchain. And everybody knows that this blockchain is where the laws sit and everyone agrees to that law. Now, if something happens where the majority of people don't agree, say the mining servers, you have more than 51% that don't agree. They can hard fork, soft fork, or however they want to deal with this new law and say, we disagree. The majority of us disagree and we're going to go our own way and we're going to scratch out that law. This new hard fork or soft fork, uh, that would be a hard fork. I think they would, they would hard fork out and say, we don't abide by this law. And this is the new 100% of us. And we are the new, we are the, we are, we are this blockchain that don't, that don't believe that, that believe that you should be able to wear a red shirt. Yeah. Those other people could choose to come and follow and do that or not. So I think, I think that power of truth is really, really important. And this is, it's getting pretty far my abstraction layer on it's pretty far fetched. I'm following, I'm following, yeah. Yeah. But I think that's the power of this cryptocurrency. You have to have money tied to it because you have to have you have to have the mining servers be responsible for the truth. And the only way to have them to want to be responsible and do work is to give them a little bit of money for their transaction. Yeah, some incentive, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> how how long was asking? But, oh, so go ahead. Go ahead. How how long ago uh, have you did you know about cryptocurrency? But if you're going to say something related to the other topic, go ahead. Oh, I heard about it. 20, 2015, I want to say. Mm. I know it's been around longer. I, I've heard stories of like, um, like there was a pizza delivery driver. Yeah, there, yeah. And <clears throat> goes to deliver pizza, and the guy's like, "Hey, I don't need I don't need money, but I have this thing called Bitcoin." And there's like. 20 of them on this thumb drive <laughs> and the guy was like okay yeah do you happen to remember your reaction the first time you heard it about bitcoin or cryptocurrency it 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 definitely made me think about value because i was someone was asking me like i don't understand how it has value i'm like well why is a diamond more valuable way more valuable than a jug of water like you need water to survive, but yet this compressed allotrope of carbon that just sits on your hand and does really nothing at all, significantly more value than a jug of water. And it's just, it's just, it has value. It's subjective. It just does. It's like, that's how much people are willing to pay for it. Whether it makes sense or not, that's the value. That's why. And so it may be like, when I first heard about Bitcoin and it had a price, I think it was like 500 bucks at the time. It made me wonder about value, like how subjective. And then I started wondering like, is is Bitcoin gonna be like My, MySpace? Whereas MySpace <laughs> Dude, was like the, I, uh... on the vanguard of social media and just rapidly went downhill for some reason. And then Facebook just 
took over, ate up the whole market. Like, is Bitcoin going to do that? Is it going to be the first one? Because oftentimes the first platform is not the longest one. Like, for instance, AOL, or even before AOL, is one called Prodigy, I remember, and then those are gone. Well, I think AOL is still around, but... Yeah, I think I said it on my... Pre- yeah. Uh, I said it on my previous podcast where um, I think Bitcoin is Friendster actually, because Friendster was for, or at least from my memory, there's Friendster in my in my memory, yeah. and then MySpace, and then Facebook. You're right. I don't know if Ethereum 1.0 is MySpace, and I'm hoping that Ethereum 2.0 will be Facebook, but. That will, I mean, we'll just wait and see how, how the evolution of all this happens, cultural evolution and, and the evolution of the, of the cryptocurrency. When I say cultural evolution, if humans socially adopt Ethereum 2.0 or not. Yeah. <clears throat> um, that's interest, really interesting. I wish I, if the way you said you reacted to the first time you heard about Bitcoin, I wish at least I would have had that reaction. My reaction was and I was actually emailed my friend recently. I said, "Hey, do you remember the time when you brought up Bitcoin to me?" This is so this is a friend that I worked with back in 2008. So Bitcoin came out to late 2008, early 2009. Right. So that friend who brought it up to me, he knew about the white paper. So it wasn't even released yet. And oh, that's right. if I would have just put in one freaking dollar, man. Ah. But the reason being is when he told me about it, he said he said, so what do you think about this, this Bitcoin stuff? It's digital money that someone wrote this algorithm where it's supposedly unhackable. And when I heard that, as a, I was a junior, junior programmer. Eh, I was, yeah, about junior, maybe mid programmer at that time. I sat there and I thought real quick, no one could code something that unhackable. No one could do it. In my mind at that time, I didn't know any technology that I was capable of. And to touch back on your RSA encryption stuff that you mentioned RSA, do you happen to know much about RSA itself, like the the algorithm un- or the the math of math math underneath it? RSA, to my knowledge, is there's no publicly known way or documented way to to break it. I know the guy who I, I know it was three math. Mathematician, sorry, you got RSA stands for Rivest, Shamir, Edelman. And they almost gave up and they all got drunk off like Manischewitz wine. And two of them passed out. And the other guy stayed up and had some kind of like mathematical epiphany in which there was some problem they were stuck on. And in his drunken stupor, he's stumbling around. He realized, oh my God, I got it. And they, they figured it out. That's in the that's in the MIT documentation. I I read about that. I'm like, I, I better double check this. He was drunk when he came up with this. <laughs> the that's uh, true. I I I'm probably completely wrong. I'm I'm just gonna say it anyways. I thought that they took the basis of uh, World War II encryption when mm-hmm. they they built onto that because it's just simply just prime numbers. Um, it's just right. yeah, it's just a mathematical way to use two prime numbers. Get out two uh, two values, a private key and a public key, and right. you are able to multiply or multiply or mathematically encrypt something with the private key that only the oh I'm sorry you encrypt it with the public key and only the private key can decrypt it. Um, yeah. So it was around two thousand. 16, oh, let me finish. I guess I'll finish that story. 2008, I told my friend, like, there's no way. This Bitcoin stuff, is it's going to be a fad because you can't mathematically do that. You can't do that encryption. There's no way. And I, as a junior programmer, mid, mid, mid pro, mid-level mid programmer, I should have did my research. I wish I would have did my research. That I probably would be in different shoes right now <laughs> if that yeah. was the case. Um 2016, I'm at a pool party with some friends and somebody that I knew worked in pretty high in IT. He was like the, I think he was the VP for some company in IT there. And he came up to me and said, hey, Lim, I know you're pretty, I hear you're a pretty good programmer. You, you, you've been programming for a long time. What do you think about cryptocurrency? And I was like, uh, that stuff like Bitcoin? 
So keep, I mean, I'm thinking this is like eight years later. I haven't, I haven't thought about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. And he, he comes up and says, yeah, yeah, that Bitcoin stuff. But take a look at Ethereum. I think there's some potential there. And I was like, okay. So I went home that night. I started researching Ethereum and I started researching RSA encryption and a light bulb went off and it hit me. I'm like, holy fuck. This is fucking amazing code. Like who the fuck created this Satoshi Nakamoto? But holy Ooh. shit, the fucking RSA encryption, you could do this type of algorithm and this consensus module. Holy shit, this is amazing. I think everyone yeah. should use it. Same concept, basically. Yeah, yeah. So then after 2016, I started buying and mining and whatnot. And uh, it's been a fantastic ride. Um, I, I hope the world uses this tool to do better. It's a fantastic tool. And even if it's just a tool, I'm, I'm okay with that. Humans are going to still be corrupt. Humans are going to still do their divisiveness. Um, hopefully they find a way to use this tool to broadcast more truth. Yeah, um, definitely. Hopefully. And more tools for transparency and all that. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. I don't have much hope for humans sometimes because <laughs> of all the bad news that I see, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes. So yeah, I would, a huge thing is I, I say, I think that cryptocurrency has such a bright future. Um, until I see, I don't know what the percentage is, maybe 10% of all US money into cryptocurrency, will I say uh, it's too late to invest? And I think we're at a fraction of a percent still, I think. Yeah, just I hear projections of Bitcoin going up to ten thousand, I mean, one hundred thousand, five hundred thousand. Yeah. But the thing is, is that humans are really bad at predicting things. Uh, the people who have have quote unquote predicted things, they just got lucky. Mm -hmm. Like, like you, I was told so many things that didn't, didn't happen didn't come true i remember being a senior in high school and the counselor was like okay you know you're really lucky i'm like why is that and he said well right around 2010 2015 all these baby boomers are going to retire all these jobs are going to open up you're going to be so lucky nope that didn't happen. <laughs> i was also told that every family in china would would have a car would have two cars a house with a garage and a gasoline would be like twelve dollars a gallon. Also, it did not happen. So I was told all these things out of my life that just flat out did not happen at all. So it's like stuff to balance the predictions and also knowing that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think the other thing with cryptocurrency that it it's not uh, it you can't kill it. I think that's oh. another thing that really amazes me with this technology. And that's where I also think that governments as much, they can make it very difficult. Governments can, the US government could somehow put out a law that says you can't use cryptocurrency or else you're breaking the US law. I think that will maybe hinder cryptocurrency for 30 years, 40 years, but you can't yeah. kill it. It'll keep on going. Right. It's like the internet, if um, a country probably a small country, you know, corrupt government dictator decides to ban the internet. Yeah. The internet's not going to go away. Yeah. It'll be available in other countries. And so, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Even like maybe say maybe China, if they have the great China firewall, um, there's still people getting on VPNs and getting through their internet. It's risky because you're, they're probably risking uh, issues with cops and the government there, but they still do it. I've, I've heard, I've heard stories about that like people being on vpns and there's that knock on the door yeah yeah uh what do you think's the biggest problem nationally and global na nationally or globally and what humans should humans should do to fix it i think people need to express themselves to be happy that's one of the you need, to, you need to express yourself to be happy, not 
not just for survival, but for happiness. And I think I see a lot of people just unable to because they're they're too bogged down with the news, everything's bad, and maybe they're not expressing themselves through some kind of art or activity and stuff like that. Or even just finding a different outlet to allow a release of the inside tension that's inside of them. I think that's a big problem right now. Yeah. Hopefully that changes. I, when you say that, it makes me think about this, uh, I forget which professor or who wrote this in the world that we live in, where we get a, I think I just mentioned this on this last podcast too, but when we get, when we go to work, we get a check two weeks later, or when we go to work two weeks later, we get a check that check buys food, the abstraction layer of, of that, the happiness about getting food back when we are hunters and gatherers going to kill a deer or a cow or an ox or whatever it is, that sense of happiness. Um, I think you're, I'm, I guess I'm distorting what you, you're, you're saying. You're saying happiness on expression. I guess yeah. this is happiness on achievements or accomplishments. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's, it is different, but it made me think about that. Um, hmm. it, it's interesting. You're, you're, I, I would agree with you. Uh, ex, uh, f- happiness of expression. It's interesting that we have YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, there's so many ways to express those digitally, picture, video, audio, and yet somehow we humans, I, I do agree, I think a lot of humans are not getting the time to express themselves. Is it, maybe it's, they need to express themselves with, with peers and friends. They need to have more connections with friends. Um, maybe I'm a different type of person or, or maybe I'm more, maybe I'm closer on this next topic. When I get online and play online games with my friends and there's the, the headset and we're chatting, we're talking about our days. We're talking about things that happen in current news. To me, I feel that connection there. I do feel that freedom of expression and I feel that connection. I don't, I, I don't know if I'm, majority of people feel that if I'm the majority, if most people feel that way, or if I'm, if uh, most people don't feel that way, if they were to get on chat, get on, get on a video call or play games with friends and chit chat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It could be because they're not using the platform and the tools as they are intended. So I, I noticed on with internet stuff, like once it becomes mainstream and popular and the majority of people are on it, it's like original intended purpose is kind of diluted. Like Facebook was originally like uh, for college kids to stay in touch. And then it, it started emulating MySpace. Here's me, here are my interests. And then nowadays people are like bickering at each other. Mm. Like people, my family arguing about politics and just the stuff someone said, (laughs) it's just, yeah, they're not really using it the way it was intended. So maybe that's, maybe that's why when you pointed out all the platforms and that explains the discontent. Yeah. 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 If people were to look at whatever platform you like or use the most, or each pat- platform that you use, think about what's the good thing out of that. So Facebook, I find for me, it's a nice way for family to keep in touch, but not, but just keep in touch. Just, hey, here's a photo of me going out somewhere. If you miss me, then here's a photo. Um, here's what I've been up to for the last six months, working on this, studying about this, um, pictures of that. But then like you're right, if people are getting into politics, that's probably not a, it's not a good. Yeah. It's not fun. Yeah. Not fun. Um, I do unfortunately feel that even talking about politics in person seems that's, that must be a human thing though. There's no benefit in talking. Uh, 
no, there, there's, not. there's no point. There's no benefit in talking politics where two sides aren't looking for a constructive way to to uh, make it better. If both sides just want to argue like a debate, there's no argue benefit. So yeah, 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 yeah. Not for it. I don't want to watch. Yeah, exactly, exactly. They should go in a closed room. <laughs> go ahead and debate all you want, but keep me out of that. What a uh, oh. Think, think of uh, one person, at least one person that you know personally, they don't have to know me, that should do this conversation with me. Call them out. Should do this conversation with you. I have a, I have a coworker I, I think you would do well. He's, he's invested in crypto, knows a lot about it. Oh, cool. That'd be awesome. He's always reminding me of the projections in the future of, the, of its future value. I, I think he and he's a tech guy and he awesome. yeah i think okay. he would do pretty well i I'll, I'll ask him yeah yeah uh what's his first name just first name, name only joe. Yeah. joe okay awesome we'll uh we'll see if we could reach out to him either you I, or I me i think you two would get along pretty well awesome um so we got about 20 more minutes if you want to shoot the shit or anything. Any, any thoughts? Any thoughts on this platform? What did you think? Did you, did you have uh, thoughts that this would be a full-on hardcore interview or did you think it would be just no. a conversation? Well, at, at first, like, you reached out to me and I'm like, yeah, sure. And I figured it would be like an hour. Ah, ah. And then you sent me, the, you sent me the, the form. It's all professional looking. And I saw the three hours. I was like, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> but... I, I'm on the phone so so much with my job, and every once in a while I'm on the phone for like two hours, so I know how to talk to people and stuff. And I'm like multitasking. I'm like doing something, and they're they're talking to me about their <laughs> because I know people like to talk about themselves. So if you're in a position, if you're helping them, and you just want to help them relax, just so like so, how's your day going? And then. Being in IT, it's like I'm part engineer, I'm part detective, I'm part therapist. <laughs> Psychologist. <laughs> Some people just tell me all their problems. Like we used to, before COVID, we had like this kiosk thing where we'll, one once a week, someone will get this kiosk and we would rotate it. And I, I felt like a bartender most of the time. I would be sitting there and just, oh, I'm sorry, you're having a, wow, that's really sad. Like this. This this one girl, she was engaged and it got it got broken off, and she got engaged again. But the the new fiance had a baby, and I guess her mom didn't like that, and so she's telling me about all this stuff. And I didn't say this, of course, but I thought you know because it was such a short time period, I thought if you were smart about it, you could keep the same venue, the same <laughs> vendors, everything. Just like, swapping up the groom at that point but there's so many things i could say i just don't yeah like i just i'm like a i'm like a bartender i'm just like oh wow i'm, I'm sorry you're going through that it's very very bad and, and, and some of my coworkers are straight to the point just okay thank you have a nice day hang up the phone yeah in your own words if i were to if you were to try to uh just describe this type of platform to somebody just is this an open conversation or is it an interview? Is it, how would you describe it? If somebody had no idea? I would call it extemporaneous. So there's, there's no script obviously, but there's like a guidebook on how the conversation will go and recommendations and little cues of the flow of the questions and so it's kind of open, kind of scripted. Scripting is a bad word, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. There's a good balance between yeah. the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very comfortable. I didn't feel nervous or anything like that. Cool. So what other, uh, what other hobbies are you into on your free time? Uh, I've been playing a lot of guitar. I oh. play one to two hours a day. And oh, nice. How, how long ago did you pick up a guitar? Since I was about 14, yeah. Oh, nice. Um, so, oh yeah. Yeah. Me, me and, uh, Jordan and Steve back at West Hills. We, uh, I remember mean, back that. then when I was 17, we we're in a band. Um, yeah, I think, I remember that. 
Yeah, I think Steve, Jordan, and uh, Jason are still doing it right now, I think. I might be wrong. Um, oh, well, do you have, uh, are you playing guitar just to, just to play? Are you looking to eventually get into a band? or? I was in a cover band like a decade ago, and it just fell apart. But I, I, I missed it a lot because it, it kind of reminded me of hanging out with your friends at lunchtime at school because we had to sit down and behave ourselves all day long and that was a good outlet to let everything out again the need to express yourself mm -hmm. and um like we had like this we rent a rehearsal studio for like a couple hours and it was pretty cool one thing that i i don't get to ask musicians often is um playing in a band i get this this magical amazing feeling when i connect with the drummer bassist and the singer there's something that is yeah. nothing that i there's all exactly i think yeah what was it what was that I, I, I know what you're talking about yeah okay so do you do you still have that feeling nowadays did was it stronger when you were earlier in your um i guess um path of playing guitar it, it's like a relationship so you could have that feeling with the same people and then over time it goes away hmm. so you could like um like we could re that band i was in like 15 years ago whatever we, we could reconnect and that feeling will probably not be there it's just gone hmm. it's just it's, it's it's the magic of the time it's like it's inexplicable so Huh. Interesting. Totally. I, 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 I really like the way you put that in words. I actually, I would actually, I don't know. I don't know the, uh, the answer, but I would actually disagree and think that it would be the opposite meaning for me. I if so. I, if I went to play with, uh, Jordan, Steve and Jason right now, I bet you, I may still get that feeling, but I, I don't know. I'm just speculating. I have no idea. I could be wrong on that. It's just, um, there is an aspect of getting older and certain things that you used to find fun aren't as fun anymore. Yeah, that too, yeah. I don't know if I've gotten that way with with music, with, with connecting with a band. I know I've gotten that way with the guitar itself. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoy it from time to time, I still do. Yeah. But when I was 14, 17, that was, that was, I enjoyed playing the guitar every minute. It was magical too. I remember you sat in a computer class, you sat in the back and you were always talking about it. <laughs> Cause I, got, I could hear your conversations and stuff and. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Um, I'm trying to think, I, did I sit next to Jeremy? Do you remember who I sat next yep. to? Oh <laughs> I don't remember talking about guitar back uh, back there. I thought uh, that's interesting, though. That's no, like, you know, because you 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 in a band with uh, I think just Jordan, just Steve, Rob, Rob, Rob Lewis. Oh yes, yes. Oh yeah, Rob. Yeah, um, yeah. I saw. Well, the last time I saw Rob now was, I think I saw him when I was twenty six, twenty seven years yeah. old. Um, Oh, when you said those parties. Yeah, was, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I forgot. Yes. Those uh, parties were fun, man. Those were the were, days. <laughs> I love those days. Uh, hopefully you had fun at the parties. What what do you think about them? I thought they were great. I didn't really didn't really know what to expect. There was all sorts of people. There was like people <laughs> in high school. There was people because you were like a bridge to a lot of many groups in high school. And I noticed you kind of carry that through your adulthood. Ah, uh, I'm our, our, high, our high school didn't have an in crowd. It was like multiple crowds and there was like microcosms of crowds within the crowds. Yeah. But you were sort of like a, a bridge to a lot of those different groups. Holy crap, you're probably the only person that I've I've I I kind of mentioned that I try yeah. to say when I talk about high school I say, "Yeah, I was a bit of a social bu bu butterfly. I would just jump between groups, but that's yeah. funny that you actually <laughs> And the party is kind of reflected that. I think you carry that over into your adulthood. Huh, that's awesome. Yeah, if uh, I I think uh, one of my cousins, we want to throw parties like that again eventually. But uh, 
I don't know if we'll get to it. We, we've uh, been kind of discussing certain things of doing that again. Um, yeah, the dynamic will probably be different because we're a little bit older. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, I remember what, one, one friend was supposed to be the designated driver, and he told us he didn't drink at all. I'm not going to say who it was. <laughs> And I was like, where, after a few hours, I'm like, where is he? And I found, we saw him with a, you know, the bottle of like Newcastle, something real light. And he's just like, yeah, and he's like running up and down. And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Was that, was that, that wasn't at one of my parties. It sounds like. I'm... Yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, it was? was? <laughs> yeah. He's like, I don't know. I don't drink. And I'll, someone gave him something and he just. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, thinking back to high school, what do you what do you think about it? Just just random thoughts. Like I, when I think about high school, I think about God damn, I'm such a different person. I feel like there's yeah, me too. Kind absolutely of, kind of like three phases in life. Like the young adult, the middle adult. My twenties, I was kind of I was a different person, and then now yeah. I'm a different person. What do you? I like to think I'm a completely different person. Um, like my parents were divorcing when I was in high school, which is like the, the worst age for your parents to divorce. Mm. And I think if you're a toddler, that's probably the best because you don't really quite, you're not processing the negative stuff, but I don't think I was handling that very well. So um, ah. yeah, and it, you know, Columbine happened when we were in high school. Yeah, and, and actually, I mean, I think down the street at, uh, what's that other the high school that was down the street? Santana, yeah. Santana. Two years later. Yeah. yeah. So I remember there are three events in my life that happened where I immediately can sense in the air nothing will be quite the same ever again. Hmm. And that's Columbine, 9-11, and of course COVID. But I remember with Columbine, they are like, we call them narcs, but they're basically the security people that walked around with walkie talkies and then some kids could go home rolling just right across the street and that was cool but after columbine uh, all of that ended yeah they, sh they closed everything off and uh that was kind of sad and everything was more closed off and more rigid and like again i felt like i couldn't really express myself which was you know pulling pranks and you know telling jokes and all that stuff <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I remember your pranks. I remember, I think I remember always being almost like after, uh, I would see you and your group of friends always laughing after something. So it must have been the pranks, but I didn't know you guys were pulling pranks. I always yeah. saw you guys laughing at something. <laughs> yeah, there, there was someone, I don't, I don't want to say who it was, but they had discovered um, a flaw in the the change machine of the live in the high school library they had a change machine and again i'm not saying who it was but he had discovered if you put a, a penny in the coin slot and you like vigorously shake this machine it would spit out quarters <laughs> so for a couple of weeks i would like sitting in the library just going you know, shaking his <laughs> quarters just spilling out and probably got to eat lunch free and it's and then we, we pranked ourselves someone poured cereal and milk all over my car in the parking lot. It was, hmm. it was great. Yeah. Uh, since high school, what do you think kind of, what were some of the highlights in your career or just personal life hobbies, even, even things, just uh, vacations could have been something that just really ha big highlights for you. Big highlights. Um, I think getting into it is the biggest highlight. Yeah because of just feeling important, feeling needed, being able to think so logically, you're becoming metalogical where that becomes abstract thinking and be able to pull that off. I think that's a big highlight. Uh, mine sounds bad, but there's a good ending. Um, one of the highlights I could think about now is when in 2009, 2010, I was kind of getting sick of the rat race here in America. It felt like I was working so hard and not getting promotions or raises that I wanted. Right. 
Absolutely. And I wasn't getting ahead. I wasn't enough money to just every, I don't know, every month just felt like a struggle to just get by to yeah. some degree. So, yeah, I that feeling. so 2009, 2010, I, I threw away my life here in America. Uh, I messed up my credit. I, all my car, my cars that had loans on it. I just like skipped out on everything. I booked a flight to Sydney, Australia. Wow. And yeah, I, I went, I went ape shit stupid. Um, was it deliberate? It was like conscious where you're like, I'm in the, it was, you... it was conscious on the thought that I could hopefully use my IT background and land a decent job in Australia Okay. and change my, change the setting that I was at and hope to find something new. Um, yeah. Things didn't go as I planned. It, uh, finding a job in Australia wasn't as easy because of the visa situation and whatnot. So then I bounced over to Vietnam for six months, and then wow. I came came back to America and didn't find didn't uh, didn't look for a job four months after that. So I went I went without a job for thirteen months, twelve twelve or twelve or thirteen months, oh, about a year. And what I'd learned out of that was to be frugal. I think prior to that, I was living beyond my means. And I have a feeling most Americans are like that, unfortunately. Yeah. I think a lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck. And it caused me to live within my means. I, I, I mean, you could see on the other, maybe you could look from another perspective that I trimmed down too much. I kind of live very little. I, I'm, I live on very little. So you could look at my life as, well... It's not kind of that fun because I'm not I'm not living an Instagram life, but I live within my means, and if something were to happen, I have enough money to to last for two, three, four years if I go jobless. Um, that's almost opposite of what most Americans are, I think, um, right now. That's good because that gives you optionality, it gives you flexibility. Wealth, it seems like wealth isn't really how much money you make. It's your location, you know what I mean? Hmm. I think I think of wealth at, as time sometimes. Meaning, if you Absolutely. have yeah, if you have the time to do whatever you want, that's almost more wealth than than being able to buy a yacht. Now, I understand buying a yacht, you have some options there that are that I can't that I don't. But uh, uh, that wealth, there, yeah, being rich in time is 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 almost like wealth. I don't know, man. A yacht. I mean, <laughs> there's a saying, the two best days in your life is the day you buy the boat and then the day you sell it. <laughs> the guy that told me this, he's like, you know, boat's an acronym, right? I'm like, well, what does it stand for? He goes, bust out another thousand. <laughs> yeah. And I've seen boats and driveways sitting there for yeah. like a couple of years. And yeah. Like, yeah. Who wants to come home from work and like work on a boat and like scrub and scrub and scrub yeah. and scrub? Yeah. It doesn't look fun. Yeah. It's, well, it feels like it's a hobby where you got to have enough money to hire people to do everything that yes. you want, then, then it'll be fun. This is more of a symbol, really. Yeah, yeah. That life experience to, to mess up my life and then come back in 2012 until now, it was, a, it was wow. a world of a change where I went from zero dollars. I, I went from, I think I had $200 on my bank account to, I mean, if you told me how much money I have in my bank account right now, uh, and you said to that person in 2012, 2010, you're going to have this amount in your bank account in about 10 years. I would have not believed you. There's no way. I would be like, no way. That's Sounds a like you were just burned out. Yeah, yeah. No, that definitely, yes, uh, like a midlife crisis or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, but it's weird that the midlife crisis came what it's came pretty early. Um, if that if that's a midlife crisis, there's no time to there's no map. For yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Someone once told me um, you need to have a reset button, and I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? And he he said, well, sometimes you have to hit your reset button and reset yourself, your life, whatever, in a good way. And then he also said, sometimes someone else hits that button for you. Or life will just hit that button for you. Like it'll, your life will change, and you can't control it. And you just gotta hit that reset button. And it sounds like wait, that's what you did. Yeah, you came out 
pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, I came out really well. Um, yeah, I, I didn't know about that from you. Yeah. Yeah, I, went, I came out well in the sense of it. I started, I mean, during 2016, I, I was, my job was doing so well and my bills were so low. I was like dropping like $1,800 a month to my 401k. I was dropping an additional $1,500 a month to cryptocurrency every month for like two years straight almost. Nice. It, it was nuts. Yeah, it was like, but I mean, there was some factors in there. Not, it wasn't, it wasn't a glamorous life. And on top of that, it was actually, oddly, probably the most depressing time in my life, sort of. I was making money, but yet I was in a situation where in this city that I'm in, Las Vegas, I just wasn't finding the group of friends that I wanted for whatever reason. I was meeting a lot of people, but I just... There was something I wasn't connecting with people. I don't know what it was. Um, I still have yet to really find a circle of friends that I want here. Um, I may try to change my location sometime soon, but I, I don't know what it is. Where are you living at these days? I'm still in Vegas. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I there's a small chance. Uh, there's a small chance I keep, may come back to San Diego in a year or two, but there's there's yeah. some investment things that I gotta sit and wait through. Yeah, I know some people moved out there. Yeah. Yeah, the cost of living was so cheap that I was able to freaking throw so much money to 401k and cryptocurrency. It was fantastic. Wow. Yeah. Um, but it also has to do, the, the things that I learned from 2010, I paid out my car outright. I don't have a monthly car payment. I keep my rent low. I, I don't buy super unnecessary things. I do mm -hmm. buy silly things, but I don't, I don't yeah. go crazy with it. Um, I don't have an Amazon Prime account. I don't have a Netflix uh, monthly payment. I don't have all these extra bills that I just get by. So, All right, man. Uh, we're done. If you want to say anything more, if you need to get going, um, if you want to have conversations about random shit, that we can still record if you want.